What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omnisensei. Welcome to, What If I Was in Marvel as Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse, Part 12. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. T. Tony, Pepper whispered, her voice quivering with emotion. Tony managed a weak smile. Hey Pep, he said softly. For a moment, Pepper stared at him, as if unable to believe her eyes. Then, the dam broke and tears spilled down her cheeks. She launched herself at Tony, wrapping her arms tightly around him, and he returned the embrace just as fiercely. Unlike the spies in Iowa, Pepper didn't need any verification or codes to believe that this was her Tony. After all, she was married to the man and had his child. Nor did she have a paranoid mind, born from a lifetime of espionage. You're really here. Pepper choked out, her voice filled with joy and disbelief. I told you I'd be back, Tony replied, his voice breaking with emotion. I'm so sorry, Pep. I never wanted to leave you and Morgan. Pepper pulled back slightly, looking into his eyes as realization dawned on her. You knew, she said, her voice trembling. You knew that you were coming back. A whole year, Tony. We thought you were gone forever. Why didn't you explain better? I know, but I was kinda in the middle of dying. I'm so sorry, Tony said, his heart aching at the thought of the pain he had caused. I wish I could have come back sooner. I really do. Pepper's fingers gently caressed his cheek, her touch filled with tenderness. It doesn't matter now, she said softly. You're here, and that's all that matters. Just then, they heard a faint sound coming from down the hall, and they turned to see Morgan, donned in her pink bunny pajamas, standing there, rubbing her sleepy eyes. Mommy, who's at the door? she asked, her voice still groggy with sleep. Pepper smiled through her tears, kneeling down to her daughter's level. Morgan, sweetie, look who's here, she said, her voice filled with both joy and trepidation. Morgan's eyes widened when she saw Tony standing there. Daddy, she whispered, her voice tinged with uncertainty. Tony's heart broke at the sight of his little girl, looking both excited and cautious. Hey, bug, he said softly, using his nickname for her. It's me. Morgan's eyes filled with tears as she ran into Tony's open arms. Daddy, she cried, clinging to him tightly. Tony held her close, burying his face in her hair, inhaling the sweet scent of children's shampoo. I'm so sorry I was gone for so long, he whispered, his voice choked with emotion. I promise I'll never leave you again. As they stood there, Pepper wrapped her arms around both of them, holding her family close. The pain of the past year was slowly being replaced by the overwhelming relief and joy of having Tony back. They had spent countless nights longing for him, and now, he was here, in their arms once more. The three of them stood in a tight embrace for what felt like an eternity, finding solace and comfort in each other's presence. As the initial excitement settled, Tony shook his daughter, who held him tight like a koala. I think you should be in bed, but since it's a special occasion, why don't we all camp out in the living room? Pepper smiled, wiping away her tears. I think that's a great idea, she said, her voice filled with warmth. Hand in hand, they walked to the living room, where Tony got comfortable in the couch with Morgan attached to him like a supermagnet. Morgan refused to separate from her father, her grip locked around his neck. Seeing this, Pepper couldn't keep the smile from her face. Since you're trapped, why I go and get some pillow and blankets? Pepper said and walked off. Morgan nodded, still processing the fact that her father had returned from the dead. I missed you, daddy, she said softly, her voice filled with love and longing. Tony smiled, sitting on the edge of her bed. I missed you too, Bug, he replied, playing with her long hair. But I promise I'm here now, and I'm never leaving again. Promise? Morgan asked, her eyes searching his for reassurance. Tony placed his hand over his heart. I promise, he said, his voice unwavering. I love you both so much and I'll always be here for you. Morgan pulled her head up, staring at her father with a frown. No, you have to say it right, she practically ordered. Huh? Oh. Tony was confused for a moment before realizing what she meant. I love you 3,000, he said, bringing a blooming smile to her face as she resumed her position, glued to his body. Soon enough, Pepper joined them on the couch, bringing along all sorts of pillows and blankets, and the three of them cuddled close, reveling in the feeling of being together again. 
As the night stretched on, they shared stories, laughter, and tears, catching up on all that had happened during Tony's absence. For Morgan, it was a night she would never forget. Her father had come back from the dead, and she held on to him as if afraid he might disappear again. But as Tony tucked her in and kissed her forehead, she felt safe and loved, knowing that he was truly back for good. As they finally drifted off to sleep, Tony found himself overwhelmed with gratitude and love. He had been given a second chance at life, and he wasn't going to waste it. With his family by his side, he knew that no challenge was too great, and he was determined to make every moment count. And so, as the night turned to dawn, Tony Stark, the Iron Man, found himself surrounded by the two most important people in his life. The pain of the past year was still there, but it was now overshadowed by the joy of being together again. Time skip, one week it didn't take long for the news of Tony Stark resurrection spread like wildfire across the globe, capturing the attention of the general public and sending news stations into a frenzy. Reporters scrambled to cover the astonishing story, trying to make sense of the seemingly impossible events. Lucky for Natasha, she didn't have much to gain by stepping out into the public again, so she was able to stay dead so to speak. Tony, on the other hand, has a family, a large fortune, and a very successful company, so he had to step out into the light sooner or later. On television screens and news websites, headlines blared with excitement and curiosity, Avenger, Return from the Dead, Stark, Back from the Beyond, and The Marvelous Resurrection. How did he do it? As the news broke, people everywhere stopped in their tracks, unable to believe what they were hearing. Social media erupted with a mix of shock, skepticism, and joy. Memes and fan theories flooded the internet, with people speculating on how such a miraculous event could have occurred. Journalists sought expert opinions from scientists, historians, and even conspiracy theorists, trying to find a rational explanation for the unexplainable. But the consensus was clear. Tony Stark was indeed back among the living. The Avengers held a press conference to address the public directly. Tony and his family stood side by side, projecting an aura of love and happiness. Questions from reporters came in rapid-fire succession, but Tony faced them with composure and candor, opting to just say a short speech before heading home. Yes, I actually died a year ago. Yes, I'm now alive. No, I'm not an alien or dimensional shapeshifter. I hope that clears things up. Now, if you guys don't mind, I promise to take my daughter to the park. Iron Man out. He gave the reporters the peace sign and walked off, followed by Pepper, Morgan, and Happy, who would be driving for them. For the weeks to come, news stations continued to broadcast updates and stories, diving into the details of Tony's return to the living. The excitement of it all seemed to slowly give way to a renewed sense of hope and optimism. The world knew that if the Avengers could overcome death itself, then there was no challenge they couldn't face. The swirling energy engulfed Peter and Lily, transporting them back to their universe and their home. As the bright lights faded away, they found themselves standing in the familiar kitchen of their house. Peter's girlfriend and Lily's mother, MJ, was nowhere to be seen. Dad, we're back. Lily called out, happy to be home. Peter nodded and let out a relieved sigh. Finally back home, he said, his voice tinged with exhaustion. After all, he had been universe hopping for a while now. But as they stood there, they noticed something odd. The house was in a state of chaos. All of the doors were open, including the cabinets for some reason, not to mention the mess. Dad, where's mom? Lily asked, her brow furrowing with concern. She was here when I left. Peter's heart skipped a beat as he looked around, calling out for MJ. MJ. MJ, are you here? A distant voice echoed from the living room. Lily? Peter? Is that you? They rushed out of the kitchen and found MJ pacing nervously in the living room. As soon as she saw them, she let out a mix of relief and frustration. Lily Parker, where have you been? I've been looking everywhere for you. She shouted, both happy for her return and irate for her leaving. Peter stepped forward, trying to explain. We got caught up in something. A bit complicated. But we're back now, safe and sound. Lily nodded. It's true, Mom. We were in another universe. While MJ was contemplating what she just heard, Peter spoke up. Um, how long ago did Lily disappear? MJ's eyes narrowed as she checked her phone. About half an hour. She revealed as she scooped Lily into her arms. I was about to call Tony and have him scour the city's cameras for her, but thankfully she's back. I missed you, Mom, Lily said, giving her mother a hug. Peter leaned against the wall, allowing them to have their moment. As you can probably tell, it's been more than 30 minutes for us, he reveals, explaining their little adventure across the multiverse. MJ embraced her daughter tightly, trying to hold back tears. So it's been a few days for you, she asks and Lily nods into her shoulder. 
Peter joined the hug and the three of them stood there, cherishing the moment of being reunited. After a few moments, Peter pulled back and smiled at MJ, sorry for all the trouble. But we're home now, and that's what matters. MJ couldn't help but smile back, her heart filled with love for her little family. Well, you better not disappear like that again, okay? It's not good for my nerves. We promise, Lily said, giving her mother a mischievous grin. At least not without a good reason. Peter chuckled, shaking his head. I'll be looking to a way to stop any sort of forced multiverse travel, so you don't have to worry. After all, he didn't want this to happen again, especially to Lily or MJ. As the tension from the past events slowly dissipated, Lily couldn't wait any longer to share her experience with her mother. She excitedly recounted their adventure, from meeting the alternate Spider-Man to the confrontation with the villains, and finally, bonding with Venom. Oh, and I made a new friend! Lily exclaimed as her body was instantly covered in an ominous black goo. His name is Venom. She spoke through Venom's fanged mouth, her voice monstrous and distorted. After a long explanation, Lily managed to convince her mother that Venom wasn't a threat to her or anyone else. The three of them got to work cleaning up the mess MJ unintentionally created while frantically searching for Lily. Once the house was back in order, Lily turned to her father expectantly. Can you teach me magic now? You promised, she said, looking up at him with puppy dog eyes. MJ perked up upon hearing this. Can I learn magic too? MJ asked, matching her daughter's manipulatively cute expression. You don't have to teach me much. I just want to be able to open portals. Peter sighed in exasperation. He hasn't been back for more than a few hours and wanted to spend some time lazing around. But, sure, it would be great to have someone else that can open portals. He nodded, unable to say no to the double attack. But we'll need to get a sling ring to open portals. They're heavily restricted by Kamartage. For good reason. Lily and MJ's excitement deflated slightly upon hearing that. However, Peter reassured them, don't worry. You'll just have to become official students of Kamartage. Their excitement immediately returned. How do we do that? Lily asked. Peter couldn't stop himself from patting her on the head affectionately. We'll go and get the Ancient One's permission, of course. The idea of becoming students of Kamartage instantly thrilled Lily and MJ, though they turned nervous upon realizing they'll be meeting the Sorceress Supreme. It felt like they were being given a chance to step into a magical realm, almost like entering Hogwarts and meeting Dumbledore himself. Once the cleaning was done, the family got ready to visit Kamartage. As Peter prepared to open a portal, he laid out some ground rules. Remember, don't mention anything about us being superheroes. Only a few high-level masters know that I'm Spider-Man. To most of the masters and students, Peter Parker is just the Ancient One student and Spider-Man is an entirely separate master. He warned. Agreeing to keep the secret, the two girls nodded eagerly, excited for the adventure that awaited them. With a gesture of his hand, Peter opened a swirling portal. Stepping through, they found themselves in the grand foyer of Kamartage, a marvel of ancient architecture. The high, intricately designed ceilings adorned with ornate carvings and hanging tapestries greeted them, and the wooden walls were adorned with odd, runic carvings, filling MJ and Lily with awe and wonder. This place is amazing, MJ whispered, taking in the surroundings. Yeah, it's like something straight out of a magical story, Lily chimed in, her eyes wide with excitement. As they were about to venture further into the sanctum, they heard a knock at the door. Surprised to find someone at the entrance of the mystic realm, Peter strolled over and opened it to see a bearded, disheveled, and dirty man standing there. It was Doctor Strange. Insert picture of Doctor Strange here. Hello? Doctor Strange greeted, looking at Peter with both confusion and suspicion. After all, he was in Kathmandu, Nepal, so seeing an American teenager answer the ornate door was a bit shocking. Peter was just as shocked, not expecting to meet Doctor Strange today. This must be his first encounter with Kamartaj. He thought as he collected himself and smiled welcomingly. Doctor Strange, the Ancient One is expecting you. Laughing internally, Peter enjoyed the bewildered look on Strange's face. After all, the broken-handed doctor doesn't yet believe in magic, so he must be paranoid as hell right now. I completely understand why the Ancient One does this all the time. Doctor Strange glanced at Peter before peeking behind him, where MJ and Lily stood. I'm looking for Kamartage, he answered, his tone cautious. Is this the right place? Dot. Yes, come in, Peter stepped aside, allowing Strange inside. Doctor Strange narrowed his eyes but ultimately stepped inside. Thank you. As he led Doctor Strange inside, Lily and MJ couldn't help but be intrigued by the new arrival. Lily was just about to say hello, since she knew Doctor Strange from Tom's universe, but one glance from her father told her to keep her knowledge to herself. 
As he closed the door behind them, Peter motioned to Lily and MJ. This is my girlfriend MJ and our daughter Lily. They're here to become students of Kamartage. Strange turned to Peter, eyeing him skeptically. Your daughter? What are you two, 18? He asked, spotting the age problem. After all, it's unlikely that Peter and MJ had Lily when they were seven or eight years old. Lily perked up, happy to explain her birth. Dad made me with magic and technology. I was an artificially intelligence, right? Strange drawled out, unable to believe a word she said. Peter smirked, enjoying himself. Anyway, you're here for healing, right? He asked, eyeing the doctor's shaking hands. Strange's eyes widened. How do you know, Dash? Peter waved him off, as if it wasn't that big of a deal. That doesn't matter. Why don't you wait here with Lily and MJ? I'll go and get the Ancient One. That won't be necessary. Just as Peter was about to head off, the Ancient One appeared, greeting them with a serene smile. Welcome, everyone, she said, smiling toward MJ and Lily warmly. MJ was taken aback by the Ancient One's sudden appearance, momentarily lost for words. Lily, however, beamed with excitement. You're the Ancient One. Why are you bald? Peter sputtered, finding it extremely hard to hold back his laughter. Yeah, teacher, why are you bald? Is it because you're so old? The Ancient One chuckled softly, though the glare she gave him while Lily wasn't looking told another story. The honor is mine, Lily. Your father has told me so much about you. She replied before turning to MJ. You as well, Miss Jones? Um. MJ hummed nervously. H hello, ma'am. Nodding towards her, the Ancient One finally turned to Doctor Strange. Stephen Strange, I've been expecting you. So I've heard. Strange says, not nearly as weirded out as the first time. Seeing that her favorite part of moments like this was ruined, the Ancient One turned to the most likely suspect, Peter. You had to ruin it, didn't you? What? Peter shrugged uncaringly. Are you the only one that gets to freak the guests out? All right. Strange shouted in exasperation. I've had enough. Someone better explain what's going on, now. I know this is difficult to comprehend, but magic is real. The Ancient One began her explanation, stepping closer to the doctor. If you seek to cure your hands, I can't do it for you. Though I can teach you to do it yourself? Strange skepticism was evident. Okay, thanks for nothing, I guess. If you don't mind, I'll be leaving now. No need to show me to the door, I know where it is. Enjoy this little cult you've got going for yourself. Peter interjected, stopping the doctor in his tracks. She's not lying, you know? And if you leave now, you'll spend the rest of your life in regret. You'll never be Stephen Strange, the star surgeon again. Just Stephen Strange, the cripple. His words struck center mass, hitting all of Strange's weak spots. Dad. Lily shouted as she stomped over. Stop being mean. Peter smiled and raised his hands in the air. Sorry, sweetheart. He turned back to Strange and motioned towards Lily and MJ. Why don't you just stay and see for yourself? Even MJ and Lily are here to join Kamartaj. You can learn together, and I assure you, it's worth it. Learn what? Magic. Strange chuckled, dismissing the idea as utter nonsense. Seeing that he couldn't be convinced with words, Peter decided to just show him. With a mischievous glint in his eye, Peter took a step forward and struck out with an open palm, hitting Strange square in the chest. In an instant, Strange's astral form was ejected from his physical body, and he found himself watching in shock as his lifeless form collapsed to the floor. What? What is this? Strange stammered, completely bewildered by the surreal experience. The Ancient One, though mildly annoyed at Peter stealing her moment, sighed and motioned for him to bring Strange back. Peter smirked and guided Strange's astral form back into his body, saying, Now you can do the open your mind thing, right? The Ancient One rolled her eyes playfully. What? You don't want to do that as well? She asked sarcastically as she walked towards Strange. Strange's astral self was now back in his physical body, and he was visibly shaken from the encounter. He tried to rationalize the events, attributing them to some kind of hallucination or drug-induced illusion. Ignoring Strange's frantic ramblings, the Ancient One stood before him, placing a finger on his forehead. Open your mind, Stephen, she said softly, her voice carrying an air of command. Suddenly, Strange's consciousness was thrust across dimensions, witnessing sights and phenomena beyond comprehension. He saw worlds folding in on themselves, mystical beings, and ancient cosmic forces. It was an overwhelming and awe-inspiring experience, pushing the limits of his perception and understanding. When his consciousness finally returned to his physical body, Strange found himself on his knees, humbled by the revelations he had just encountered. He looked up at the Ancient One with newfound respect and a desire for knowledge. Please, teach me, he implored, his ego shattered and replaced by genuine humility. 
The Ancient One smiled, happy with his transformation. Welcome to Kamartaj, Dr. Strange, she said, offering her hand to help him up. Your journey into the mystic arts begins now. Peter watched from the side, pleased to see the movie moment play out in real life, though a frown suddenly marred his face. After all, he knew that this was a sign of what's to come. Eyeing the Ancient One, the teacher that was like an aunt or second mother to him, Peter wondered how he could save her. I refuse to let you die, whether you like it or not. In the courtyard of Kamartaj, MJ, Lily, and Dr. Strange stood among the other students, dressed in the traditional gray robes. They were diligently practicing katas, following the instructions of the master leading the training. Lily chatted happily with Strange, her friendly demeanor managing to chip away at his usual prickly personality. As they trained, Peter and the Ancient One observed from the sidelines, watching over the students. Peter's attention shifted momentarily as he caught a glimpse of a passing master, donned in a yellow robe. Insert picture of Kaisilius here, Kaisilius, a man with slicked back hair and piercing gaze, and the very man who would eventually betray and kill the Ancient One. With his future knowledge, Peter knew what lay ahead for her, and his determination to save her only strengthened. The Ancient One followed Peter's line of sight and frowned. Peter, let it be, she said gently, reading his thoughts. I have seen my fate and accepted it long ago. Peter turned to her with a resolute look. I won't accept that, not when I have the power to change it, he declared firmly. You've been like a second mother to me, and I won't stand by and watch you die, even if Dormammu himself stands in my way. The Ancient One couldn't help but be touched by Peter's unwavering determination to protect her. Despite her acceptance of her fate, she couldn't deny the warmth that his words brought to her heart. She remained silent, unsure of how to respond. With determination in his eyes, Peter continued, you don't have to say anything. Just know that I won't rest until I find a way to sever your connection with Dormammu and keep you alive. You've done so much for me, and I owe it to you to return the favor. A mix of emotions swirled within the Ancient One as she looked at Peter, this young man who carried the weight of the future on his shoulders. She had come to terms with her destiny long ago, but now she found herself torn. A part of her wanted to accept Peter's offer of hope and salvation, while another part was still resolved to fulfill her destiny. For a moment, the Ancient One's emotions wavered, but she ultimately nodded at Peter, her voice soft yet firm. Thank you, Peter, but you must understand that some things are beyond our control. Fate has its way of unfolding, and I have seen the countless paths that lead to this moment. Yeah? Well, fate can go F itself, Peter stated, his voice unwavering. The Ancient One placed a gentle hand on Peter's shoulder, her eyes filled with wisdom and compassion. I know you mean well, but remember that the choices we make can have far-reaching consequences. Saving me won't end well. Peter shrugged uncaringly. Then I guess we better prepare, he said resolutely. I'll protect you and deal with any consequences. Just sit back and leave everything to me. The Ancient One smiled softly, enjoying the feeling of being protected for once. Do what you will, she said, giving up. Now let's focus on the training at hand. There is much for our new students to learn. You know your daughter is quite skilled. Peter nodded as he turned to see Lily, who has already mastered the katas with ease. Well, she's my daughter, so it makes sense. He smirked smugly. Hours later, in a secluded courtyard within Kamartaj, Peter stood with MJ and Lily, ready to begin their magical training. The courtyard was surrounded by tall, ancient walls covered in intricate runes, giving it an air of mystique and secrecy. All right, let's start with the basics, Peter said with a warm smile. The first thing you need to do is focus your mind and tap into the energy of the universe. We call it Eldritch Energy. 80% of what you'll learn here is all about channeling that energy and shaping it with your will. MJ and Lily listened intently, eager to learn. They both knew that this was a rare opportunity to delve into the world of magic, and they weren't going to waste it. Peter demonstrated a simple spell, conjuring a small ball of light in his palm. See? It's all about visualization and belief. You have to believe that you can do it, he explained. MJ nodded, her determination evident. I'm ready to give it a try, she said, closing her eyes to concentrate. Peter guided her through the process, helping her visualize the energy flowing through her body and focusing it into her hand. After a few attempts, a tiny spark of light appeared in her palm, bringing a smile to her face. Lily clapped excitedly, her eyes shining with admiration for her mother. That was awesome, mom. Encouraged by her daughter's praise, MJ continued to practice, honing her newfound magical abilities under Peter's watchful eye. Now, it's your turn, Lily, Peter said, turning his attention to his daughter. Remember, you already have a connection to magic thanks to your unique origins. 
Just embrace that connection and let the magic flow through you. Lily took a deep breath and closed her eyes, focusing on the magic within her. She imagined herself as a conduit, channeling the energy from the universe. With a burst of energy, her hands started to emit a faint golden glow, far more impressive than her mother. That's it, Lily. You're a natural, Peter praised, proud of his daughter's progress. Lily beamed, feeling the magic surge through her veins. This is so cool. Can I try something else? Of course, Peter chuckled. Let's move on to something a bit more challenging. Over the next few hours, Peter patiently guided MJ and Lily through various magical exercises and spells. They learned how to create protective shields and even manipulate objects with a weak form of telekinesis. As the sun began to set, the trio took a break, sitting together on a nearby bench. MJ and Lily were both excited and exhausted from their magical training. Thank you, Peter, MJ said, her voice filled with gratitude. You're an amazing teacher. Lily nodded enthusiastically. Yeah, Dad, you're the best. Peter chuckled, ruffling Lily's hair affectionately. It's my pleasure, he said as he checked the time. It's getting late. We should head home. The night was dark and shrouded in secrecy as Kaisilius gathered his followers in a hidden chamber within Kamartaj. The flickering candlelight cast eerie shadows on their faces as they prepared a very forbidden ritual. Are you sure about this, Kaisilius? One of his loyal zealots asked hesitantly. Tapping into the dark dimension is dangerous. Kaisilius glared at the doubter with unyielding conviction. The Ancient One hoards power from the dark dimension for herself, he retorted. We deserve to know the truth and claim our own power. Dormammu will grant us the immortality and strength we seek. Nervous glances were exchanged among his followers, but they were all united in their desire to defy the Ancient One's teachings and forge their own path. They surrounded a carefully arranged pattern of runes and symbols on the floor, ready to channel their combined energies into the spell. With determination in his eyes, Kaisilius led the chanting, his voice resonating with power. Astropi Thalassa Puer Mysticana Galios Arcanos Magike Phoibos Dactylos, Nymphi Thavmeda, Theocelia, the words spoken were ancient and forbidden, invoking the very essence of the dark dimension itself. The chamber began to hum with energy as the ritual intensified. As the incantation reached its climax, the room seemed to pulse with an otherworldly aura. A swirling vortex of darkness materialized in the center of the rune pattern, and the air grew thick with an oppressive presence. A distorted voice echoed from the void, surprising everyone. Who dares touch my dimension? Kaisilius stepped forward, undeterred by the ominous response. I am Kaisilius, and we are seekers of the truth, he proclaimed. We wish to make a pact with you. The darkness in the center of the vortex seemed to shift, as if contemplating Kaisilius' proposal. Dormammu, a cosmic entity beyond comprehension, had little interest in the affairs of mortals, but the audacity of these sorcerers had piqued its curiosity. You seek my power, the distorted voice replied. What do you offer in return? We offer loyalty, servitude, and the Ancient One, Kaisilius declared, knowing that the Ancient One was feeding off of his dimension without an ounce of repayment for countless years. We will be your devoted disciples. Dormammu's presence seemed to grow stronger, seeping into the chamber like a chilling wind. Very well, the voice intoned. Your pact is forged. Embrace the power of the dark dimension, and know that you shall serve me for all eternity. As the connection with Dormammu intensified, the zealous followers felt a surge of energy coursing through their bodies, empowering them with dark mystic might. Kaisilius and his followers had taken a dangerous step, willingly aligning themselves with an entity far beyond their understanding. Unbeknownst to them, hidden in the shadows, the Ancient One had been silently observing the forbidden ritual, her face expressionless, but her mind racing. Where did I go wrong? She wondered, her eyes lingering on Kaisilius. After all, seeing one of the masters she trusted the most betraying her in real life was far different than her usual visions of the future. It felt far more real than she imagined it would. Sat at his computer desk while MJ slept in the bed behind him, Peter started formulating a game plan to save the Ancient One. I already have the Resurrection Elixir, which can keep her alive, but now I need to find a way to sever her connection to the Dark Dimension. In the heart of the night, whilst Peter worked diligently on finding a way to help his teacher, a dark and sinister presence loomed over Kamartaj. The ancient compound, usually cloaked in an aura of tranquility, was now gripped by an ominous aura that sent shivers down the spines of its inhabitants. Kaisilius, flanked by his devilishly empowered zealots, moved stealthily through the shadows, their footsteps masked by a veil of magic. With their knowledge of Kamartaj's defenses and the element of surprise on their side, they navigated through the countless secret passages and concealed corridors, steadily advancing toward their nefarious goal. 
As they approached the secluded library housing the vast repository of mystical knowledge, Kaisalius signaled his followers to halt. His eyes glinted with an unholy fervor as he envisioned the power contained within those ancient tomes. The librarian, a venerable sorcerer well-versed in the secrets of the arcane, was lazily guarding the entrance to the restricted section. Oblivious to the impending threat, he was engrossed in the study of an ancient grimoire, illuminated only by the flickering light of a candle. With a silent command, Kaisalius motioned his followers to surround the unsuspecting librarian. Like specters emerging from the darkness, they closed in, their eyes gleaming with a malevolent glee. In a heartbeat, Kaisalius materialized behind the librarian, his hand wrapped in a dark, ethereal energy. Before the librarian could react, the malevolent sorcerer struck swiftly, severing the head from the shoulders with a single, cruel stroke. The room fell into an eerie silence, the only sound the echo of the librarian's lifeless body slumping to the ground. Kaisalius and his followers wasted no time, stepping over the fallen sorcerer to enter the grand library. The shelves were lined with ancient manuscripts, grimoires, and scrolls containing knowledge that had been carefully guarded for centuries. Kaisalius, driven by his thirst for power and knowledge, began to meticulously select the most forbidden and potent tomes, which he knew the Ancient One would never allow him or any other master to touch, let alone study. Each book he chose was a forbidden fruit, and as he stole them away, he could feel the tendrils of dark energy coursing through his veins, empowering him further. His followers eagerly followed suit, their faces filled with a mixture of reverence and trepidation at the forbidden knowledge they were acquiring. With their mission accomplished, Kaisalius and his followers made their way back through the labyrinthine passages of Kamarta. The weight of their stolen knowledge seemed to cast an oppressive aura over the once hallowed halls, a grim reminder of the betrayal that had taken place. As they reached the courtyard, Kaisalius turned back to look at the imposing structure of Kamartaj, once his home and sanctuary. His gaze lingered on the tower where he had once trained and learned under the watchful eye of the Ancient One. We are free now, Kaisalius declared, his voice resonating with a mixture of triumph and bitterness. No longer bound by the shackles of tradition, we shall forge our own path and wield the power of the Dark Dimension. The zealots nodded in agreement, their faces filled with zeal and devotion to their newfound cause. With their stolen knowledge, they believed they could reshape the world according to their desires, heedless of the consequences. Together, Kaisalius and his followers vanished into the night, leaving Kamartaj behind them. Their departure marked the end of an era and the beginning of a dark chapter in the history of the mystic arts. The next morning, in the aftermath of their betrayal, the inhabitants of Kamartaj would awaken to a grim reality. The beheading of the librarian and the theft of many books in the forbidden section sent ripples of alarm throughout the compound, leaving the sorcerers to grapple with the security breach and the implications of Kaisalius' actions. Even the students, like Strange, who weren't privy to much information, heard about the theft. Even the world of magic has its problems, I suppose, he thought. The Ancient One, as ever, remained resolute and calm in the face of adversity. Though her heart ached for the loss of her trusted librarian, she knew that this was what needed to happen. It was her fate and only Peter was knowledgeable enough and willing to change it. The next morning, Peter woke up early to see MJ and Lily off to school. Lily was excited to study magic again today, but sadly she had to get through another day middle school first. While MJ playfully reminded Peter that he was welcome to grace the high school with his presence, despite his overwhelming absences, Peter smiled. Maybe I can spare some time to drop by for lunch, he said, thanking God that his academic achievements gave him special privileges. After seeing them off, Peter quickly changed into his Spider-Man suit and swung through the city toward the Avengers Tower, enjoying the sights along the way. As he arrived at the tower, Peter made his way straight to Tony Stark's workshop, where he found the man himself tinkering with one of his Iron Man suits. Hey Tony, Peter greeted as he entered the room. Tony glanced up and grinned when he saw Peter in his suit. Look who decided to show up to work today, he teased. Peter smiled awkwardly, realizing his multiverse travel may have hurt his work attendance as well. Come on, you know I'm always working, Peter replied, pulling off his mask and sitting down next to Tony. In fact, I happened to visit two separate universes recently. I even managed to save a version of your sorry ass from dying. You're welcome, by the way. Tony's eyes widened with curiosity and jealously. Why do you keep leaving me out of all the fun stuff? He asked in mock disappointment. Well, I didn't exactly choose to leave in the first place. Peter chuckled. But don't worry, I managed to bring back something interesting, he said reaching into his suit and pulling out a hard drive. He plugged the hard drive into Tony's workstation, revealing the stolen plans and data from Olivia Octavius on multiverse travel. 
Tony's interest was immediately piqued as he browsed through the information. Wow, this is some high-level stuff, Tony remarked, his excitement evident. Olivia Octavius, huh? Dot. He read red name that was printed all over the research. I've never heard of her. Peter smirked. That's because she doesn't exist in this universe. Olivia Octavius, or better known as Doc Ock, is a villain from the first universe that I visited. As you can see, she has some interesting ideas pertaining to multiverse travel. I thought we could work together on this, he suggested. Tony raised an eyebrow. Are you asking for a partnership, Mr. Parker? He said playfully. You bet, Mr. Stark, Peter replied with a grin. I've come to realize that the multiverse is vast and filled with endless possibilities. With our combined brains, I think we can be safely traveling the multiverse by the end of the year. Tony leaned back in his chair, considering the proposal. All right, you got yourself a deal, Webhead, he said, extending his hand for a shake. Peter shook Tony's hand, feeling a surge of excitement. He knew that with Tony's expertise and the resources of Stark Industries, his dream of controlled multiverse travel will take place much sooner. As they delved deeper into the data and started brainstorming ideas, Peter's mind was already racing with the possibilities that lay ahead. I wonder if we'll be able to visit non-Marvel universes? In the depths of a hidden underground facility, Yelena Belova, once a victim of the Red Room's insidious mind control, now stood defiant against her former oppressors. The bloody corpse of a rogue widow laying before her was a haunting reminder of the life she had once been forced to lead, a life of violence, manipulation, and heartless obedience. Insert picture of Yelena Belova here. Yelena was sent by the General Drakov, the commander of the Red Room, to kill a traitorous widow, but in the process, Yelena was exposed to some sort of gas, which immediately freed her life of all foreign control. Her mind was free, her will her own, but sadly, it was too late for her target. The woman who managed to free her of her shackles was already dead. And as the dust settled and Yelena emerged victorious, the rogue widow lay defeated, her body still and lifeless. A mixture of sorrow and relief washed over Yelena. She had killed the woman who helped her, acting as nothing but a puppet dancing on the strings of the Red Room's puppeteers. But now, she was free. In the aftermath, Yelena felt a momentary dizziness, her consciousness clouded by the after-affects of the antidote, her mind experiencing freedom for the first time in a long while, leaving Yelena in a daze. Soon enough, realization dawned on her, the gas she inhaler was an antidote, a serum designed to neutralize the Red Room's mind control agent. It was a chance encounter that had freed her from the chains that had bound her mind and soul for so long. With her mind finally her own, Yelena knew what she had to do. She couldn't waste this opportunity. She had to help others still enslaved by the Red Room's control. Raiding the dead widow's supply of antidotes, Yelena packed everything up and ran off, disappearing into the night. Days later, after a long and stealthy journey, Yelena Belova, a former Black Widow, stood outside the towering structure of the Avengers Tower in New York City, her backpack filled with the few vials of antidote that she could find. Her heart raced with nervous anticipation, unsure of how her sister would react to her sudden appearance. Taking a deep breath, Yelena walked into the lobby, her confident demeanor masking the turmoil inside. The receptionist looked up from her desk, a friendly smile on her face. Hello, welcome to Avengers Tower. How can I assist you? The receptionist asked politely. Yelena's mind raced for a moment, searching for the right words. I'm here to see Natasha Romanoff, she said, trying to keep her voice steady. Tell her, her sister's here to visit. As Peter and Tony continued to work on Olivia Octavius's research, their minds fully engrossed in the fascinating possibilities of multiverse travel, Jarvis's voice suddenly echoed through the intercom. Mr. Stark, there's a woman here to see Natasha Romanoff. She claims to be her sister. Tony looked up, slightly surprised. Natasha has a sister? I didn't know that, he mused, scratching his head. Curiosity got the better of Peter as he recalled the Black Widow movie. Jarvis, what's her name? He asked. One moment. Jarvis replied as he went quiet for a moment. She says her name is Yelena Belova, but I can't seem to find a registered individual matching her description under that name. Yelena Belova? Tony's mind word, trying to recall any information about her. He couldn't remember Natasha ever mentioning a sister named Yelena. Send her up to my office, Peter said, trying to portray confusion in his voice. I'll handle it from here. Standing from his seat, Peter quickly donned his mask. He gave Tony a sheepish smile. Sorry, Tony. Duty calls. I promise I'll be back soon. Tony huffed in mock annoyance. Sure, sure, go save the day. I'll just be here, unlocking the secrets of the multiverse, he teased. Peter chuckled as he walked out of the workshop, leaving Tony to his devices.
As he made his way up to his office, he contemplated Yelena's arrival. She never showed up like this in the movie. Although the small change alarmed him, this may actually work out for the better. Yelena couldn't have contacted the Avengers in the movie because it was just after the Civil War, but thankfully, Peter has been able to avoid any mess like that from cropping up. The Avengers were completely united, at least for the time being. Peter suddenly remembered something. Wait a minute, shouldn't Wanda and her brother pop up soon? In the heart of the Avengers Tower, Peter sat in his office, awaiting his guest. He impatiently tapped his fingers on the surface of his desk, contemplating how to handle the situation. He couldn't help but imagine a division of badass Black Widows working under him, and as he thought of that, some rather naughty images filled his mind. But as soon as they came, another image overlapped every single one of them. It was MJ, her eyes glowing menacingly in a red hue. She held a sharp blade in hand, eyeing his family jewels with a sharp glare. Finally, the door to his office opened, and Yelena Belova stepped inside. Her eyes widened in surprise as she saw Spider-Man waiting for her. Uh, I was expecting Natasha, she said hesitantly, unsure of what to do. Peter waved off her concerns. Natasha's currently on a mission, he explained. I'm Spider-Man Natasha was my teacher, so when I heard her sister came to visit, I was intrigued. Especially since she's never mentioned anything about a sister. Or family for that matter, right? Yelena replied, finding herself slightly taken aback. Well, why don't you take a seat? Peter gestured toward a chair, which she hesitantly took. So, what brings you here? Peter asked. As I said, Natasha never mentioned having a sister. Yelena hesitated for a moment, considering her words carefully. I'm Yelena Belova, she revealed. I'm Natasha's adoptive sister and a former Black Widow operative under General Drakoff's control. When Natasha defected, the remaining Black Widows, including myself, were subjected to a mind control program. But recently, I managed to break free from it, and I came here hoping to get Natasha's help and the Avengers' support in freeing my sisters and shutting down the Red Room once and for all. Peter nodded his head, her story matched exactly what he knew. I see, he replied, his voice calm compared to Yelena, who was a big ball of nerves. After all, she was seated before the world's most famous superhero. I'll do everything in my power to help you, Peter said earnestly. Though you'll have to wait until Natasha returns and verifies your words. As long as she okays it, the Avengers will gladly assist. Yelena nervously gripped her fists. What should I do before then? Drakoff must already know that I defected. He might even know that I'm here. Peter shrugged, not threatened in the least bit. Then he can come and experience the tower's defenses. But... Yelena appeared conflicted. What if he sends widows? They aren't in control. I don't want them to die. Peter smiled. We have non-lethal defenses as well. He revealed as he leaned back in his chair. You heard her Jarvis? Suddenly, a disembodied voice filled the room, surprising Yelena. Yes sir. The defenses will be set to capture for the time being. Yelena's eyes gleamed with hope, gratitude evident in her expression. Thank you, she said sincerely. I didn't expect Spider-Man to be the first person I'd meet here, but I'm glad it was you. Peter smiled beneath his mask. I'm glad too, he replied. Once Natasha returns, we'll discuss our plan of action and take it from there. But until then, let's find you an apartment to stay in. Peter stands up, followed by Yelena. I'd let you stay in Natasha's apartment, but she may not like that, so... Wait. Yelena suddenly called out, pulling off her backpack. While we wait, can you find a way to make more of this? She reaches inside and pulls out a case containing five vials, each filled with a red liquid. What is it? Peter asked, feigning ignorance. It's the antidote for the Red Room's mind control, she reveals, cradling the case as if it were the most important thing in the world. This is all that was left. Peter takes the case, which she was more than hesitant to part with. Okay, I'll get right on that. Now, let's head down a few floors and find you a place to stay until Natasha returns, after setting Yelena up in an apartment and leaving the antidotes for Jarvis to analyze and replicate, Peter departed the tower, intending to have lunch with MJ and Ned. In the bustling cafeteria of Midtown High School, MJ and Ned sat at their usual table, surrounded by the clamor of students chatting and laughing. The aroma of mystery meat wafted from the kitchen, causing a few wrinkled noses among the students. Just as MJ was about to take a bite of her less-than-appetizing cafeteria food, the cafeteria doors swung open, and a familiar figure strolled in, catching the attention of everyone present. It was none other than Peter Parker, the habitual no-show. Peter approached MJ and Ned's table with a grin on his face, holding a couple of takeout bags in his hand. Hey, MJ, Ned, he greeted them, waving the bags in front of their hungry faces. MJ's eyes lit up in delight. 
Peter, what are you doing here? She asked, sounding both surprised and pleased to see him. He did say he'd come for lunch, but when it came to school, Peter rarely showed up. I thought I'd drop by and join you guys for lunch, Peter replied. And I brought some good food too, so you don't have to suffer through the lunch lady's cooking. Ned chuckled as he eagerly peered into one of the bags. You're a lifesaver man, he said gratefully. This cafeteria food is a real disaster. Peter handed them the takeout containers, revealing tacos from the best Mexican spot in the city. MJ beamed at him. You're the best boyfriend ever, she said, already stuffing her face with food. As they enjoyed their tasty lunch, Peter filled them in on the progress they were making on Olivia Octavius's research. Ned's eyes widened in shock as he heard Peter talk about the multiverse. Dude, can you send me to another universe too? I want to get a demi-human girlfriend with cat ears. Peter and MJ turned to Ned with raised brows. Have you been watching hentai again? Peter asks as Ned began blushing up a storm before stuffing a whole taco in his mouth, so he doesn't have to answer. Whatever, I'll see what I can do when everything is operational. After they finished eating, Peter decided to bring up the other reason he came here. Actually, I have a mission for you too, if you want it. Ned froze in place, his eyes going wide. Is it an Avengers mission? He asked, obviously excited. Peter nodded. Yeah, if you're interested dash, Ned practically jumped out of his skin in excitement. Yes, we'll take it. MJ sighed, but reluctantly nodded alongside him. Sure, what do you need us to do? Well, have you heard of the Red Room? Deep within the secure and shadowy confines of a hidden Russian underground facility, General Drakov, the enigmatic and ruthless leader of the Red Room, received the alarming news about Yelena Belova's defection. His usually composed demeanor faltered for a brief moment as he processed the information and his grip on the tablet tightened. Insert picture of the general here. One of his trusted agents, an operative loyal to the Red Room's cause, stood before him, delivering the report with a mix of fear and uncertainty. General, we have received confirmation. Yelena Belova has defected from the Red Room, the agent reported, keeping his head lowered in deference. Drakov's eyes narrowed, his mind already calculating the implications of Yelena's betrayal. Tell me everything, he demanded, his voice steely and cold. The agent hesitated for a moment, aware of the general's formidable reputation for dealing with those who failed him. She seems to have broken free during her last mission, he explained cautiously. We were unaware of the extent of her programming's instability. By the time we realized she was gone, Drakov's jaw tightened, the revelation clearly unsettling him. And her whereabouts? He pressed, trying to maintain control over the situation. We've been tracking her movements, but she's been highly elusive, the agent replied, feeling a tinge of unease. She seems to be somewhere in the east coast of America. A dangerous glint flickered in Drakov's eyes. The Avengers, he repeated, his tone laced with disdain. She must be trying to find her sister. The agent nodded in agreement, understanding the general's frustration. We believe she might be planning to expose the Red Room's operations. He continued. She's a liability, General. Drakov's expression darkened, and his mind began to devise a sinister plan. Find her, he commanded. Bring her back alive if possible. We need to find out how she broke free, but if it's not viable, then at least bring her body back for study? The agent nodded once again, understanding the gravity of the order. Yes, General, he replied, before quickly leaving the room to execute Drakov's command. Alone in the dimly lit chamber, General Drakov contemplated the unfolding situation. Yelena's defection threatened to expose the darkest secrets of the Red Room, and he knew that he could not allow that to happen. The walls of the underground facility seemed to close in around him as he pondered his next steps. That night, Agent Natasha Romanoff returned to the Avengers Tower after completing a particularly easy assassination mission. Her eyes were tired, but her spirit was still strong as she made her way through the familiar corridors of the tower. As she approached the gym, heading to her apartment, she heard the faint sound of training equipment clinking and the rhythmic thuds of punches hitting a heavy bag. Curious, Natasha quietly entered the gym, expecting to find one of her fellow Avengers honing their combat skills. To her surprise, it wasn't one of her teammates but a young woman she didn't recognize at first. The woman had dirty blonde hair, and she moved with the grace and skill of a highly trained fighter. Yelena Belova, clad in a simple training outfit, was lost in her training routine, her focus unwavering. Natasha's eyes narrowed as she realized who the woman was. Yelena, her sister in all but blood. Her heart skipped a beat, and a mix of emotions washed over her. She had left her behind, hoping to allow her only family to live a normal life. Yet here she was, training with the grace of a trained killer. Yelena, Natasha called out, causing her sister to jump in fright. 
and Natasha. As Natasha stood in the gym, her heart raced with emotions she thought she had buried long ago. Yelena's eyes filled with a mix of relief and anger as she saw her sister, and before Natasha could react, Yelena charged forward, her movements fluid and precise. Natasha. Yelena's voice was filled with a raw intensity as she swung a high kick aimed at Natasha's head. Natasha deftly dodged the attack, her body instinctively reacting to the threat. You left me. Yelena spat, her eyes blazing with fury. She followed up her kick with a rapid series of punches, each one laced with a deadly intent. Natasha parried the blows, her training kicking in as she maintained her calm exterior. Yelena, I didn't want you to be a part of this life. She tried to reason with her sister. I left to protect you. Yelena's attacks only grew fiercer as her anger bubbled to the surface. Protect me? You abandoned me, Natasha, she shouted, a mix of sorrow and rage in her voice. I thought we were family, but you left me to suffer in that hellhole. With a quick spin, Yelena aimed a low sweep kick, trying to knock Natasha off balance. Natasha leaped over the leg, somersaulting in midair to gain distance from her relentless sister. The two black widows circled each other, their eyes locked in a tense stare down. Natasha was beyond confused, but she couldn't let her guard down. She knew that Yelena's emotions were clouding her judgment, and if she didn't defend herself, this reunion would end in disaster. Yelena lunged forward again, aiming a series of swift punches at Natasha's abdomen. Natasha expertly blocked and countered, her strikes measured and controlled. She wasn't fighting to defeat Yelena, but to subdue her without causing any serious harm. Their movements were a mesmerizing dance of power and grace. Natasha's years of training with the Red Room were mirrored in Yelena's every move. It was like looking into a mirror from her past, a reflection of the younger Natasha she once was. With a sudden shift in strategy, Yelena attempted a leg sweep followed by a roundhouse kick. Natasha anticipated the move and leaped over the sweeping leg, ducking under the roundhouse kick with impeccable timing. She swiftly followed up with a gentle palm strike to Yelena's chest, just enough to knock the wind out of her without causing significant damage. Yelena stumbled back, her breath catching as she glared at Natasha. You think you're better than me, don't you? She seethed, her voice laced with hurt and bitterness. Natasha shook her head, trying to appeal to the lost connection between them. No, Yelena. Now, can you please tell me what's going on? Why are you here? She asked, her voice soft yet determined. Yelena's fists clenched, her resolve wavering for a moment. But the pain in her heart quickly turned into anger once more. She didn't plan to fight, but as soon as she saw her sister stroll in, this boiling anger erupted deep inside of her. You don't get it, Natasha. I was alone, abandoned, and you never came back for me, she accused, her voice breaking with emotion. Before Natasha could respond, Yelena launched herself forward again, a renewed fire in her eyes. She threw a barrage of rapid strikes, each one driven by frustration and despair. Natasha evaded and deflected the attacks, her heart heavy with the burden of the past. I can't change the past, Yelena, Natasha said, her voice carrying a touch of sorrow, but I promise I will make things right now. Just please stop and explain to me what's going on, okay? What happened? Yelena wouldn't relent. All of the anger and resentment that filled her body over these many years finally erupted. The very fact alone that Natasha had to ask those questions sent her over the edge. Their fight intensified, both sisters equally matched in skill and determination. Each blow and dodge was a testament to their shared history and the bond that had been severed. Natasha refused to fight back with her full force, unwilling to harm her sister more than necessary. Technically, she could end this fight in a few moves, but what good would that do? I should just let her tire herself out? As the minutes passed, the tension in the room grew, and the once smooth movements of the sisters started to falter. Yelena's anger and pain were draining her strength, while Natasha remained calm, waiting for the right moment. Finally, Natasha saw an opening. Yelena's exhaustion was becoming evident, and her attacks were losing their edge. With a quick step, Natasha expertly flipped Yelena, sending her falling to the ground. Before Yelena could react, Natasha swiftly moved in and wrapped her arms around her sister, pulling her into a tight embrace. Yelena struggled for a moment, but her resistance slowly melted away as tears welled up in her eyes. I'm sorry, Yelena, Natasha whispered, her own tears escaping. I never wanted you to suffer, but I had to protect you from the life I led. I couldn't bear to see you become like me. Yelena's anger and resentment finally gave way to her true emotions. She buried her face in Natasha's shoulder, clutching onto her sister as years of pent-up pain poured out in tears. I thought you abandoned me, she sobbed, her voice choked with emotion. I will never abandon you again, Natasha vowed, her heart heavy with remorse and determination. Now tell me what's going on? 
What happened to that family I left you with? You really don't know, do you? Yelena asked, shocked and saddened that her sister didn't even bother keeping tabs on her. The family you left me with all those years ago, they're dead. Natasha's eyes widened in shock. What happened? She asked, her voice trembling with concern. Yelena's gaze dropped to the floor, and she took a moment to steady her emotions before continuing. The Red Room found us. Only a month after you left, Drakoff came knocking at the door with a platoon of soldiers. They tried to stop them from taking me, but they didn't make it, she explained, her voice strained with grief. Natasha felt her heart sink as she heard the devastating news. Guilt washed over her, realizing that her attempts to protect Yelena had led to this tragic outcome. She had left her sister with the hope of giving her a better life, and instead, it had led to unimaginable pain. But that doesn't make any sense, Natasha said, her mind racing. I killed Drakoff. I took down the Red Room. How is he still alive? Yelena looked up, her eyes filled with pain. I don't know, she replied. But this wouldn't have happened if you had simply took me with you. Before Natasha could press for more answers, Jarvis's voice unexpectedly filled the room from the intercom. My apologies for interrupting, but Spider-Man is waiting for you both in his office, the AI announced. Natasha frowned, wondering what could be so important that Spider-Man would need both her and Yelena. What's this about Jarvis? She asked. In response, Jarvis projected an image on the holographic display, showing the surveillance cameras around the Avengers Tower. Natasha's eyes widened as she saw the footage of two groups of women in tight, tactical bodysuits infiltrating the building. Widows. Yelena's voice quivered with fear. They know I'm here. Natasha's mind raced, realizing that the Red Room, which she thought was long dead only seconds ago, had somehow tracked Yelena to the Avengers Tower. She knew they couldn't afford to let these highly trained operatives wreak havoc in their home. We need to stop them, Natasha said, her voice resolute. Her expression hardened into that of a seasoned operative ready for battle. I'll help. Yelena stood beside her sister, ready to fight. Just as they were about to head out, Jarvis's voice appeared again. That won't be necessary. Why? Natasha asked. Is Spidey handling it? Just watch, Jarvis says cryptically. Natasha and Yelena watched the surveillance cameras closely, observing the two teams of Red Room Widows making their way through the Avengers Tower. Thankfully, it's past work hours, so all of the non-mechanical staff has already left for the night. As the first team of Widows entered an elevator, the doors closed behind them, sealing them inside. Unaware of the danger, they waited patiently for the elevator to arrive at their destination. Their faces are partially covered, but the look in their eyes was noticeably dull and almost robotic. Suddenly, a low hiss filled the elevator, and the widows began to cough as a cloud of knockout gas filled the small space. Panic spread among the team as they desperately tried to find a way out, but the gas quickly took its toll, and one by one, they slumped to the floor, unconscious. Natasha and Yelena exchanged glances, realizing that the building's defenses were doing the job for them. Meanwhile, the second team of widows continued on their mission, passing by a seemingly harmless cleaning droid, which was waxing the floors. Unbeknownst to them, the droid was equipped with a hidden mechanism. As they walked past, the droid silently fired sleep darts at their backs, striking each widow with precision. One by one, the widows collapsed, unable to fight off the sudden onslaught. They never even had a chance to identify the source of the attack, the droid already retreating down the hall to continue its work. Natasha and Yelena couldn't help but feel a mix of satisfaction and relief as they saw the two teams of Red Room Widows neutralized by the building's defenses. Their friends and allies in the Avengers were safe, thanks to the security measures they had put in place. As the automated defenses continued to maintain control, the two sisters turned their attention to the captured widows. They knew that these operatives were just pawns, forced to follow the Red Room's orders without question. We need to find out why they're here, Natasha said, her voice determined. They're here for me, Yelena revealed, her eyes trailing off to the floor. Suddenly, Jarvis's voice appears again. Excuse me, but Spider-Man is waiting. He said and I repeat, what the hell is taking them so long? In Peter's office, Natasha and Yelena walked in, and Peter couldn't help but notice the complex emotions on their faces. On the way up, Yelena explained her ordeal of being mind-controlled by the Red Room, and that the captured widows were currently under the same influence. Peter turned to Natasha as she and her sister took a seat across from him. So, she's really your sister, huh? Natasha nodded solemnly, not by blood, but we grew up together. Peter nodded understandingly. What do you want to do about the Red Room? I can put you in charge of this and give you a team, if you want. He wondered if she wanted to fight them again. Of course, I'll help where I can. Natasha's eyes hardened with determination. I'll take care of it. I don't know how Drakoff survived, 
but I failed once to take him down. I won't fail again. How do you think he survived? I mean, you put two in his chest and one between the eyes, right? Yelena asked, repeating what they were taught in the red room. Did you check the body? Natasha took a deep breath, her mind drifting back. I had a plan to take down the red room, but in order to do that, I had to take out Drakov, but that was impossible. Flashback a much younger Natasha Romanoff stood outside her small, run-down apartment, clutching a small card with a phone number she had received from an odd bow and arrow-wielding agent. He gave her an offer that could change her life forever. The past few years had been a constant struggle for Natasha as she tried to distance herself from the Red Room's darkness, all while looking after her newfound baby sister, who had been thrust into a life of violence and manipulation. Opening the door, Natasha found Yelena sitting at the table, surrounded by piles of books and dangerous-looking weaponry. The sight of her trying to learn the art of assassination filled Natasha with anguish. At least, I was able to bring her with me on my missions, or else who knows what they'd do to her. Natasha thought as she frowned softly. You should be in school, Yelena. Yelena looked up, her eyes filled with a mix of innocence and curiosity. But I want to be like you and you didn't go to school, she said, her young voice filled with admiration. Natasha's heart ached at the sight of the young girl aspiring to become a cold-blooded murderer like her. She knew she had to make a choice, either let Yelena continue down this dark path or take the opportunity she was given and give her a chance at a better life. Later that night, after tucking Yelena into bed, Natasha sat alone in the darkness, contemplating her decision. The bow-wielding man's words still echoed in her hand, urging her to join S.H.I.E.L.D. and work from within to dismantle the Red Room. I can't let Yelena go through this, Natasha whispered to herself, her resolve firming. I'll take down the Red Room, protect her, and make sure she has a future free from all of this bullshit. The next day, Natasha made the call, accepting the offer to join S.H.I.E.L.D. It was not an easy decision, as it meant eventually leaving Yelena behind. But Natasha knew it was for the greater good. After all, she can't give her the life that she deserves. She had to ensure that Yelena had a chance at a normal life. But before any of that, in order to win Shield's trust and prove herself, she had to do the impossible. Destroy the Red Room. And with a heavy heart, Natasha knew what she had to do. One fateful night, Natasha stood hidden in the shadows, watching the great General Drakov and his young daughter enter their luxurious house. Her finger hesitated over the wireless detonator in her hand. She had planned for every contingency, calculated every risk, but there was one thing she hadn't accounted for, the sight of a child in the blast zone. As she stared at Drakov's daughter, innocence radiating from her, Natasha's own memories of Yelena as a young girl flooded her mind. Tears welled up in Natasha's eyes as she struggled with her emotions. She didn't want to take an innocent life, but she also knew that this was the only way to free countless other children from the Red Room's grip. And who knew when Drakov would give her an opportunity like this again? In the end, Natasha clicked the detonator, her heart shattering as the explosion engulfed the house. She knew that Drakov's daughter was inside, but she had to remind herself that she was doing this for Yelena and all the other children trapped in this nightmare. The weight of her actions weighed heavily on Natasha's soul as she fled the scene. The first part of her mission was accomplished, but the cost was immeasurable. She couldn't escape the guilt that washed over her, knowing she had taken a young, innocent life, even if it was to save others. Flashback end, he survived an explosion? Yelena exclaims in shock. Why ya? Yeah. Natasha stuttered, unable to reveal who else was in the house at the time. She couldn't help but wonder if his daughter survived as well, finding herself hoping that she did. Maybe she's fine. I see. Peter nodded, knowing that Natasha was leaving out a key detail. Didn't Drakov turn his daughter into a cold-blooded killing machine? Maybe I can help her. So, what do we do now? Yelena asks, ready to work. Well, do either of you know where Drakov is? Peter asks, unable to remember much from the movie. I guess, I didn't really care about the Black Widow movie at the time. Nope slash no idea, the sisters answered in unison. Okay, then let's move on to plan B, Peter says as he stands up and walks to the door. Follow me. Peter, Natasha, and Yelena stood before a row of glass prison cells, each containing a mind-controlled widow. Their dull and lifeless expressions sent chills down the sisters' spines, especially Yelena, who recalled all sorts of atrocities she had endured under the Red Room's control. Jarvis, let's do it, Peter commanded, his voice firm but filled with compassion. A red gas began to fill each cell, as the AI carefully administered the antidote that would break the mind control. Yelena jumped in place as she turned to Peter, a smile forming on her lips. You were able to make more? Peter smirked under his mask. We're the Avengers. There's nothing we can't do. As the widows breathed in the gas, 
their vacant gazes slowly began to change. Confusion gave way to awareness, and the transformation was evident as they blinked and looked around with uncertainty. In the first cell, a widow clutched her head, her eyes widening with recognition. Memories of the horrors she had been forced to commit came flooding back, and she broke down crying, the weight of her actions overwhelming her. One by one, the other widows followed suit, tears streaming down their faces as they recollected the dreadful acts they had been compelled to perform. The room filled with the sounds of their anguished sobs, as years of suppressed emotions finally found release. Yelena watched with experienced empathy, knowing all too well the pain of being controlled and manipulated. But even through their tears, there was a sense of relief on the widow's faces, as they began to regain control of their own minds. I'm free, one of them whispered through her tears, her voice trembling with gratitude. Natasha stepped closer to the cell, her heart heavy with sympathy. You're free now, she assured, her own voice choked with emotion. We're here to help you. You're safe now. With newfound hope, the liberated widows looked to Natasha as a symbol of strength and freedom. Yelena, too, approached the cell, her presence a reassuring reminder that they weren't alone in this fight. Peter stepped forward as well, hoping to get some answers from them. We need your help, he said gently. We need information about the Red Room, high-level targets, bases, and especially Drakoff's location. Can you tell us anything that might help? Through tears and shaky breaths, the widows began to share what little they knew. They spoke of secret facilities hidden around the world, the intricate network of agents and operatives, and the sadistic cruelty of Drakoff. But sadly, none of them seemed to know where Drakoff could be. As they recounted their experiences, Natasha's anger grew, but she pushed it aside, knowing that they needed to focus on gathering as much information as possible. Peter listened intently, offering comfort and reassurance where he could. We'll do everything in our power to bring down the Red Room and kill Drakoff, Natasha promised, her voice unwavering. You have my word. After getting everything they need, Peter prepared to leave, but Yelena stopped him. We aren't leaving them here, are we? She asked, motioning toward the still imprisoned widows. Yes, we are. Natasha answered for him. Why, they aren't being controlled anymore. Yelena was not happy. This time, Peter spoke up. Because they need to go through a ton of security procedures, not to mention the possibility of one or more of them tipping off the Red Room. He said, causing each captured widow to look amongst one another suspiciously. They wouldn't do that. Yelena yelled angrily. Peter nodded. That may be true, but it also doesn't mean we shouldn't take precautions. Yelena glared at him and Natasha for a moment before letting out an annoyed sigh. Fine. Good, now let's go and figure out where Drakoff is hiding. Peter walks off, with the two sisters following closely behind. I think I might know how to find him, but I'm not going to like it, Natasha said, piquing everyone's interest. How? Yelena asks curiously. Natasha turns to her sister, a frown forming on her face. Simple, we ask our parents. Back in Peter's office, the atmosphere was heavy with tension as Natasha explained the next step of their plan. My and Yelena's parents were high-level members of the Red Room. Our father in particular was a close friend of Drakoff, so he might have information about his whereabouts or how to contact him. Yelena's eyes widened at the revelation. You know where they are? Can we contact them? She hasn't seen or heard from her adoptive parents for a long time. Mind-controlled slavery will do that to a person. Natasha sighed, her face clouded with mixed emotions. I don't know where our mother is. She could be dead for all I know, but our father is currently in the Seventh Circle prison, for criticizing the Russian government. It's a black site prison built for high-level prisoners. Yelena was taken aback, disbelief written all over her face. Our father is in prison? Why didn't you tell me? He raised us like we were his own children, even if it was for only a single mission. I can't believe you just wrote him off like that. Natasha's gaze hardened, a hint of remorse evident in her voice. After I joined S.H.I.E.L.D., I wanted to distance myself from any reminders of my past. I heard about his imprisonment and just thought, maybe he deserved it? You know, we did some horrible things in the Red Room, him included. I'll admit, he was a good father for the short time that we had him, but he was a horrible person. Yelena's anger softened, replaced with sadness and understanding. I get what you mean, but he's still our father, Nat. He cared for us like we were his own children, and he didn't have to. We owe him, even if he's a complete and total bastard, she said, causing her sister to laugh. In 1992, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, their father, Alexei Shostakov was sent deep undercover in Ohio to infiltrate and destroy a Hydra-occupied institute within S.H.I.E.L.D., assigned with Melina Vostikov, their mother, to pose as an American family with two surrogate daughters, Natasha Romanoff and Yelena Belova. 
The mission was simple for the newly made sisters, pretend to be a happy American family, but behind closed doors, they didn't have to act. They could have just pretended for their neighbors, friends, and colleagues, but no, Alexei treated them like his own children 24-7, as if he actually adopted them. And this small action triggered their mother, Melina, to do the same. Within a couple weeks of their mission, what was supposed to be a fake family turned into a real, loving household. Melina took care of the house and the children, while Alexei went to work, providing for the family. Natasha and Yelena even went to school for the first and last time. And between all of that, they actually spent time as a family watching TV, playing games, visiting amusement parks, cooking in the kitchen. For the first time ever, Natasha and Yelena felt what it was like to live normally. No killing, no brainwashing, no experiments, no cruelty. It was beautiful. Of course, Alexei had many faults, but at the end of the day, he was a good father to them during that mission. This is why Natasha was so quick to accept S.H.I.E.L.D.'s offer and betray the Red Room. Because when that dreamlike mission came to end, so did their happy family. Their parents disappeared, leaving them in the hands of the Red Room once again. And before they knew what happened, it was right back to killing, brainwashing, experiments, and cruelty. Natasha didn't want that for her sister. And if her parents wouldn't do anything about it, then she would. Peter watched the emotional exchange, sensing the complex bond between the sisters. From what I'm hearing, you're both right in your own ways, but your father might be the key to finding Drakov, so we should get him. And who knows what's happened to your mother. For all we know, she could be a mind-controlled slave right now. Natasha nodded, tears glistening in her eyes. You're right, we should break him out? You should have broken him out years ago. Yelena huffed, though she turned sympathetic as Natasha flinched at her words. Look, everything will be okay. Besides, he was a raging douchebag, so maybe prison has taught him a lesson? Taking a deep breath, Natasha composed herself. All right, I'll figure out a way to get him out, but we need to be careful. I'm sure the Red Room has eyes and ears everywhere, especially in Russia. Peter smirked under his mask and waved his hand. Did you forget that I can open portals to just about anywhere? He asks as a golden portal appeared, showing the rocky landscape of the moon. Just get me the prison's coordinates, and I'll have your daddy here in no time. Whoa. Yelena muttered in awe. I heard Spider-Man could open portals, but this is crazy. Natasha nodded. That makes things easier. I'll make some calls. Since it's a black site, we won't be able to get coordinates the normal way, but S.H.I.E.L.D. should have something, she said as she rushed out of the office. A half an hour later, Natasha returned to the office and handed Peter a piece of paper with the precise coordinates of the prison, and he waved his hand, opening a portal to the heavily fortified facility. The trio stepped through the portal, finding themselves in the shadows just inside the prison's high walls. Armed guards patrolled the perimeter, and surveillance cameras were placed at strategic points, watching every move. Okay, we need to be quick and silent, Natasha whispered, her eyes scanning their surroundings. He has to be in a cell designed to contain someone with superhuman abilities, so we need to find a way to get him out without triggering any alarms. Your dad's enhanced? Peter asked, pretending that he didn't already know. Have you heard of the Red Guardian? Yelena asked, as if she were bragging. You mean, Russia's Captain America knockoff? Peter answered, a teasing smirk hidden under his mask. Yelena frowned, unhappy. He's not a dash, Natasha interrupted their conversation, an annoyed scowl on her face. Can we please talk about this later? I'd like to break Alexei out without tipping Drakov off. Yelena huffed. Fine. Peter nodded. His senses heightened as he assessed the situation. Okay, I'll open another portal deep inside the prison. From there, we can try to find his cell. Natasha glanced at Yelena, her expression firm. Stay close to me, Yelena. Yelena nodded, her face resolute. We've got this. Peter waved his hand, creating a second portal inside the prison. They stepped through, finding themselves in a dimly lit corridor with cells lining the walls. Natasha led the way, her years of espionage experience guiding them through the maze-like layout. As they approached Alexei's cell, they could see him sitting in the corner, his large figure hunched over, seemingly lost in thought. Natasha's heart clenched at the sight of her father, and she swallowed back the rush of emotions threatening to overwhelm her. Both good and bad. So, do you have a plan to open that cell? Yelena asked, her voice low. A portal maybe? Peter nodded, stepping closer to the thick metal door. He tapped his knuckles on the door. His hands glowed with a faint, otherworldly light as he began to manipulate the energy around the cell door. The cell door seemed to shake for a moment before shimmering with a golden light. And in front of everyone's shocked gazes, the door disappeared completely. Yelena especially watched in awe as it vanished. Hearing the knock alongside a sudden rush of fresh air, 
Alexei looked up in surprise, his eyes widening at the sight of his daughters standing before him. Natasha? Yelena? My two little killers? You've come for me! He exclaimed, his voice tinged with a mix of shock and excitement. Insert picture of the Red Guardian here. Keep it down! Yelena snapped at him. We're here to get you out quietly, not alert the whole of Russia. She said, a small, unnoticed smile tugging at her lips. Natasha stepped forward, hiding all emotion with a blank, annoyed look on her face. Let's go, stop wasting time. Alexei's face softened as he walked up and pulled his daughters into a tight embrace. I never thought I'd see you two again. Who would have thought my little murderers would actually come and break me out? He spoke, his voice gruff with emotion. I knew you loved me more than that vixen mother of yours. Yeah, whatever. Natasha muttered, pulling away from her smelly father's grip. Maybe save the hugs for after you take a shower. Yeah, you smell like shit. Yelena agreed. With the three reunited, Peter opened a portal back to the tower and motioned for them to step in. Come on, let's get out here. This place smells like dirty Russian asshole. Finally realizing that they weren't alone, Alexei turned to Peter, seemingly offended by his comment. Is this the Spider-Man I've heard so much about? He asks, looking Peter up and down. You don't look like much, and neither do you fatty, Peter replied, eyeing the old man's protruding stomach. Aren't you supposed to be a Captain America knockoff? How did you get fat? Don't most people get fit in prison? Maybe those Russian scientists got the serum wrong. You bastard! Alexei shouted as he rushed toward Peter, who simply stepped aside and tossed him through the portal. Ugh! Motioning toward the portal, Peter turned to the two sisters, who looked very amused by what just happened to their father. Ladies first, as they stepped through the portal, Natasha and Yelena followed their father's lead, but Peter lingered for a moment, casting a quick spell on Alexei's prison cell to camouflage it. What is he doing? Alexei asked his daughters as he picked himself up off the floor. Magic, Yelena guessed due to the glowing spell circle. Satisfied with his work, Peter joined the group on the other side, the portal snapping shut behind him. Alexei looked around, confused by all the magic that was happening. What did you do? Is this some sort of witchcraft? He exclaimed, crossing himself and spitting on the floor. Peter chuckled behind his mask. Not witchcraft, just a little magic. I cast a spell on your cell to make everyone think you're still inside, while also forgetting to check on you. This way, Dracoff won't be alerted to your disappearance. Dracoff! Alexei spat again, a deep-seated bitterness in his voice. He's the one who put me in that place. We used to be like brothers, but after the Ohio mission, I told him I wanted to take Melina and my daughters away to retire as a family. He refused, and instead, he sent an army of soldiers to attack me. Natasha's eyes widened in shock. He attacked you? But I thought you were just locked up for criticizing the government. Alexei shook his head, his face darkening with resentment. No, he betrayed me. I was no longer useful to him after I started talking about retirement, and he couldn't risk me taking away his precious widows. So he had me thrown in that prison and branded me as a traitor. Yelena's fists clenched with anger. He's going to pay for this she growled, realizing that her and Natasha could have lived normal lives again if things just went a little differently. I agree, Natasha said, her voice filled with the same anger as her sister. We'll make him pay for everything he's done, but first, she turns to her father, a frown marring her face. I'm sorry, what, why? Alexei asked in confusion, realizing that things just got emotional out of nowhere. What's happening? You know, I'm not good with these sorts of things. Natasha looked down at her hands, struggling to find the right words. I believed for so long that you left us behind willingly. I thought you abandoned us to the Red Room. Alexei's expression softened with understanding. I can see why you would think that. But don't be sorry. This is my fault, not yours. I should have listened to you all those years ago. We could have stayed in America or hid in Canada. Things might have turned out differently. Natasha looked up, meeting her father's gaze. Yeah. She still felt bitter from the betrayal of that moment. All those years ago, in Ohio, Natasha pleaded and begged Alexei to not return to Russia, hoping to stay and be the family they created. After all, Yelena was only four years old, she didn't deserve a life in the Red Room. But sadly, Alexei wouldn't listen to her pleas, thinking he knew better. Alexei sighed, looking at his two grown daughters. I know I can't change the past, but I promise you both, I will do everything in my power to protect you now. I won't let anyone hurt our family again. He says seriously before a playful smile forms on his bearded face. Though we all know you don't need my protection. My little assassins could kill a thousand-man army in their sleep and no one would wake up to find the bodies. 
You take after your mother in that way. The sisters rolled their eyes at his constant mention of their killing abilities. Finally, Natasha broached the topic that they broke him out for. We need to find Drakov. Do you have any idea where he might be or how we can get in touch with him? Alexei thought for a moment before shaking his head solemnly. I wish I did, but it's been many years since I was a free man. Everything has changed by now, and Drakov won't trust me anymore after what happened. Yelena frowned, frustration evident in her voice. So, what do we do then? How do we find him? Alexei hesitated for a moment before speaking. There might be one person who could have some information, your mother. Melina was always close to Drakov, and if anyone knows where he is or how to contact him, it would be her. Natasha raised an eyebrow, curiosity peak. Is she even still alive? It's been so long, and I haven't heard anything about her. Alexei's smirk. My lovely Melina is a survivor. Nothing but death itself could kill that woman. She's resourceful and cunning. If she's alive, she might be hiding somewhere, keeping a low profile. Or she's still working for Drakov. He frowned at that last part. Yelena looked determined. Then we need to find her. She might be our only link to Drakov. Peter leaned forward, intrigued by the possibility. How can we reach her? Alexei looked at each of them, his expression solemn. I need to warn you all, dealing with Melina is not easy. She's cunning, manipulative, and sexy vixen. And if she is working for Drakov, then this could get messy. Natasha's face hardened with determination. We'll take that risk. And if she is willingly working for Drakov, then I guess Yelena and I only had one real parent after all. Yelena nodded, her eyes glinting with resolve. We'll tread carefully, but we have to try. Alexei took a deep breath, mentally preparing himself. All right then, there's a specific radio frequency that Melina and I used to use to talk during missions. If she's still using that signal, we might be able to reach her. Peter snapped his fingers and a ham radio appeared on his desk. All right, let's get to work. After tuning the ham radio to the specific channel they believed Melina might be using, they spent an hour periodically calling out over the receiver. Hello, is anyone there? Please respond. Frustration was starting to set in, but just as Alexei was about to complain for the hundredth time, a female voice with a Russian accent crackled over the radio. This is Melina, the voice said, causing everyone in the room to hold their breath. Natasha took the lead, speaking clearly into the radio. Uff, hi. It's Natasha and Yelena. We need your help. There was a brief pause before Melina responded, her voice guarded yet tinged with curiosity. My daughters, is it really you? Why are you calling? How do you know about this channel? Alexei, who had taken a shower and changed into fresh clothes, grabbed the receiver from Natasha. You know, Melina, I never stopped thinking about you all these years. Even in prison my love for you couldn't be extinguished, like a roaring forest fire. Yelena groaned, rolling her eyes. Seriously, Dad? Now is not the time for this, she said, while Natasha couldn't help but smile at the familiar, yet cringe, lines her father would always spew. Melina's voice softened slightly. Alexei, you never could resist your own charm. But enough of the pleasantries, what do you want from me? After some banter, Alexei got down to business. Melina, we need to talk. In person, where can we meet you? The radio went silent for a moment before Melina's voice returned. Meet me at this address 629 Road. I'll be waiting. She gave them the address, and then the radio went silent. The room was filled with uncertainty, and all eyes turned to Alexei, who was still holding the receiver. Well, this is probably a trap. Natasha spoke what everyone else was thinking, but we have to go. We can't let this opportunity slip away. In a dimly lit room, Melina sat by the ham radio, her mind clouded and her emotions suppressed by the grip of mind control. General Drakov loomed over her, his presence suffocating as he commanded her every move. Insert picture of Melina here. Tell them the address, Melina, Drakov ordered, his voice cold and commanding. Melina's expression remained blank, her eyes devoid of any spark of life. She spoke into the radio in a monotonous tone, meet me at this address, 629 Road. I'll be waiting. As the transmission ended, Drakov stepped closer, observing her every move. Good. Now turn off the radio, he commanded. Without hesitation, Melina reached out and switched off the ham radio, her movements mechanical and robotic. She was a puppet in Drakov's hands, bound by the invisible shackles of mind control. Drakov's satisfaction was evident in the cruel glint of his eyes. He reveled in the power he held over Melina, using her as a pawn in his twisted game of manipulation and control. You will do as I say without question, Drakov sneered, his voice dripping with malevolence. Melina nodded obediently, her mind locked in a state of compliance. She was a highly skilled agent, 
once formidable and independent, but now reduced to a mere pawn in Drakov's grand scheme. For many years, Melina was forced to carry out Drakov's orders without protest, her free will extinguished by the relentless grip of the mind control. She no longer recognized herself, lost in the labyrinth of manipulation that Drakov had ensnared her in. In moments of respite, when Drakov was not watching, flashes of her past life would briefly surface, memories of her daughters, Natasha and Yelena, and the love she once shared with Alexei, the big, lovable idiot. But those memories were fleeting, washed away by the powerful conditioning that held her captive. Despite her altered state, Melina still longed for freedom. Deep within the recesses of her mind, a flicker of resistance remained, a tiny ember of defiance that refused to be extinguished. A couple of hours later, everyone assembled in Peter's office, ready for their mission to confront Natasha's mother. Natasha donned her tactical suit, and even gave a spare to her sister alongside some weaponry as well. Alexei was offered a spare Captain America suit, but, are you messing with me? He exclaimed in disgust as he spit on the floor. I would rather die than wear that American scum's colors, and since he refused, Peter just shrugged it off and left him to his Adidas sweat suit. When it was time to go, Silk, MJ, and Black Noir, Ned, stood beside Peter, their faces hidden as they embraced their roles as superheroes. Peter promised them an Avengers mission, so now was the time to deliver. Waving his hand, Peter summoner a shimmering portal. Let's go, Peter said, stepping through the portal, followed by a very excited Ned Leeds, and the rest of the group followed shortly after. As they emerged on the other side, they found themselves in the front yard of a quaint Russian farmhouse. Standing by the front door, a portly pig caught their attention as it bumped into the door, inadvertently opening it for them. Guess that's our invitation, Natasha remarked, eyeing the peculiar scene before them. Once inside, they found Melina sitting at the kitchen table, her expression impatient. Took you long enough. Poor Alexei has been waiting outside for hours in the cold, she chided them. Alexei couldn't help but glance at the pig with a mixture of disbelief and amusement. You named the pig after me? He asked incredulously. Ignoring her husband completely, Melina waved over the group. Come and join me for dinner. I didn't expect so many of you to show up, but I think I made enough, as they reluctantly took their seats, Peter's heightened senses picked up on a strange number of presences around the farm. Hidden soldiers, probably under Drakov's control, waiting for the perfect moment to strike, he thought. Without even looking at the food, Natasha began questioning her mother. We came to ask if you know where General Drakov might be? Why do you want to know? Melons asks back, guarded. Natasha frowned in annoyance. Because he... After a quick explanation of what Drakov did to Alexei and Yelena, Natasha turned an expectant eye to her mother. Basically, he locked up your husband and enslaved your daughter. Now where is he? Melina went silent for a moment before finally speaking. Let me tell you what really happened during that family mission years ago. She paused for a moment, as if trying to find a way to speak. It wasn't just about stealing weapons technology from S.H.I.E.L.D. or HYDRA. It was about stealing the key to controlling the mind. We inadvertently gave Drakov the means to subjugate anyone he pleases. Natasha's eyes widened in shock. What do you mean? Melina took a deep breath, the weight of her past decisions evident in her gaze. I was more than just a widow, Natasha. I had a scientific background that Drakov found valuable. He wanted Hydra's mind control technology, and I was tasked with verifying it for him. Yelena's expression turned from curiosity to anger. So, you willingly helped him? Melina's eyes filled with regret. I had no choice. I was a widow and a widow completes her mission, no matter what. I couldn't refuse. Amidst their conversation, Peter noticed something peculiar. First, Melina seemed to be fighting to speak, as if she could barely get the words out. Is she veering off of Drakov's instructions? He wondered. And secondly, Melina was tapping on the kitchen table constantly. She seemed to be keeping a certain rhythm to it as well, which was odd. What is she doing? After a moment of thought, Peter began deciphering it as Morse code, and soon realized that she was desperately trying to warn them not to eat the food. Don't eat food, she repeated, her message over and over again. But thankfully, no one here was dumb enough to eat or drink anything. Well, except for one person. Like a starved beast, Alexei dug into his dinner as soon as he sat down, savoring the flavors without a care in the world. Meanwhile, the others remained captivated by Melina's revelations, unaware of the danger they were in. Seconds after Peter realized this, Alexei fell face first onto his dinner plate, snoring loudly. He's out like a light, Peter remarked, trying not to laugh. Natasha's eyes narrowed, suspicion growing as she glanced at her mother. So you are working for Drakov? 
Melina was forced to smile. No, I would never, my dear. Now, let's get back to dinner. After all, you don't want to hunt down Drakoff on an empty stomach. As she spoke, Melina's hand slowly grabbed the knife beside her plate and swiftly stabbed herself in the leg. Ugh, don't eat. Soldiers nearby. She yelled as the pain freed her trapped mind for a single second. And when that second came to an end, as if she didn't just stab herself, Melina smiled and continued eating. Mmm, this chicken is so good, she said, her voice almost haunting. Everyone watched in shock, especially Ned and MJ, who haven't dealt with something remotely like this before. They're mainly used to stopping normal crimes in New York City. The oddest thing they've ever seen couldn't measure up to this. Okay, I think this has gone on long enough, Peter says as he stood from his seat and pulled a small spray canister from his suit. Hello, miss whatever the hell your Russian last name is. Please look this way. And when she turned her head, Peter sprayed her in the face, engulfing her in a cloud of antidote. With a cloud of red dust enveloping Melina's face, her eyes widened in shock as if she was waking up from a nightmare. The effects of Drakoff's mind control started to fade, and a glimmer of recognition returned to her eyes. Peter swiftly pulled the knife from her leg, and used a quick spell to heal the wound. Melina, can you hear me? He asked gently, his hand on her shoulder for reassurance. Melina blinked, trying to grasp her surroundings. What's happening? She asked, her voice shaky and confused. We'll explain later, but first, where is Drakoff? Natasha asked, pissed off that even her mother was under his control. I, I. Melina seemed to be in a daze, unable to respond for the moment. Peter turned to Alexei, casting another spell to remove the drugs that had put him to sleep. The big man groaned and rubbed his head, slowly regaining consciousness. What? What happened? Did I drink too much vodka? He mumbled, looking around in confusion. No time to explain, Alexei. Get ready to fight, Peter said, his senses alerting him to an approaching threat. Even Silk could feel the soldiers closing in, and she immediately warned the group. Guys, we've got company. A lot of them. Time to show them what we're made of, Ned said, excitement evident in his voice as he practically bounced in excitement. Moments later, the farmhouse was lit up by assault rifles, tearing countless tiny holes in the walls as a hail of bullets turned the place into Swiss cheese. Acting quickly, Peter summoned her a golden translucent dome around the kitchen table, stopping every bullet that came their way. In a matter of seconds the small house turned into a battlefield as the Avengers faced off against the soldiers outside. Natasha and Yelena moved with precision and grace, finding cover and pulling their pistols before returning fire, taking down the soldiers with deadly precision. Alexei, now fully awake and fueled by anger, displayed his formidable strength, rushed out of the house and overpowering his opponents with each strike. He would pick up soldier after soldier, using them as shields to avoid the rifle fire, only dropping them when they became too mangled to be a proper shield anymore. Silk leaped through the air, dodging bullets with ease, taking out the soldiers from a distance with a few well-shot webs. Black Noir rushed to cover and began throwing household objects at the soldier. Thankfully, his super strength could turn even the most fragile figurine into a conclusive projectile. Peter left the dazed Melina in the Golden Dome and danced along the battlefield with agility and finesse, using his webs and hand-to-hand -hand combat skills to subdue the enemies with ease. After all, these were only normal soldiers, so he wasn't worried one bit. Everyone, including the enemy, watched in awe and fear as Peter swept through dozens of soldiers at a time, dismantling them as if they were made of cardboard. Soon enough, Melina awoke, free from Drakoff's control. Without a second thought, she rushed to fight alongside her daughters, determined to make amends for her past actions. Her combat skills, honed from years of training, the battle raged on, the clash of metal and the sound of gunfire filling the air. Despite their outnumbered situation, the Avengers swept through hundreds of soldiers with relative ease. As the dust settled and the last soldier fell, surrounding the once quaint farmhouse with blood and bodies, the Avengers stood victorious. They gathered in the farmhouse, catching their breath, especially Ned who's never seen so many dead bodies before. I think I'm gonna puke. Ned rushed to the kitchen sink and instantly emptied his stomach. Natasha looked at her mother with a mixture of emotions. Thank you for helping us, she said, her mind finally at ease. Thankfully, either of her parents were the traitors that she thought they were. Melina smiled weakly. I'm sorry for everything, Natasha. I never wanted any of this to happen, she said, feeling responsible for everything. Well, you can make it right, Peter said as he took a seat amongst the wreckage. Where's Drakoff? He's on the Red Room, she says, getting confused looks all around. It's a giant airship facility that he can move anywhere he want. Since he was here only a few hours ago, that means it's nearby. I think it's west of here, 
Then we have to move fast if we want to catch him before he flies away. Peter stood up and waved his hand. Melina nodded, eager to help. I can guide you there, but I don't think we'll make it in time dash before she could finish. Peter opened several portals, each leading further and further to the west, looking for anything that wasn't a clear sky. The group gathered around him, watching curiously. There it is, Melina whispered in shock, pointing at a distant cloud-covered tower-like structure, amazed by Peter's magic. The Red Room was an imposing sight, a sinister testament to Drakoff's malevolence. Insert picture of the Red Room ship here. Opening a portal inside the floating facility, they stepped through, arriving in a large hangar filled with much smaller aircrafts, which were probably used to ferry people on and off of the facility. Before setting off to cause havoc, Peter opened a portal and dumped a pile of spray cans and smoke grenades onto the floor. Remember, use the red dust antidote on the widows instead of wasting your time. We can save them, so we should at least try. You have spray cans for close targets and grenades if they're farther away or in a large group, Peter reminded the group as they snatched as much antidote as they could carry. With a strategic plan in mind, they stormed the facility, moving as a synchronized unit. Peter made sure to neutralize all the aircrafts before leaving the hangar, cutting off any escape routes for Drakoff and his subordinate. The Avengers struck with precision, their training and powers complementing each other seamlessly. The facility echoed with the sounds of combat and alarms as they encountered widows under Drakoff's control. Working in harmony, they used the smoke grenades and stray to administer the antidote to the affected widows, freeing them from the mind control's grip. As the Avengers pressed deeper into the Red Room, their hearts sank as they stumbled upon a group of young girls, huddled together in a dimly lit chamber. Fear and confusion etched on their innocent faces, these girls were mere children, aged between four and eight, far too young for a place like this. Thankfully, they didn't seem to be under Drakov's mind control, and if they were, the red smoke that poured into the room from the hallway would have already taken care of it. Natasha's heart ached at the sight, memories of her own past flooding back. She stepped forward, her gaze softening as she approached the frightened girls. It's okay, you don't need to be scared. We're here to help you, she reassured them gently. The young widows in the making eyed Natasha warily, uncertain of her intentions. Their training had instilled a deep-rooted distrust for outsiders. One of the older girls, around eight years old, took a hesitant step forward, her small fists clenched. I'm not afraid of you, she declared with a brave attempt at defiance, though her trembling voice betrayed her fear. Natasha kneeled down to be at eye level with the girls, her tone soothing. I know it's hard to trust us, but we're not here to hurt you. We want to help you. Another young girl, around seven years old, piped up, her eyes glistening with tears. Really? You'll take us away from here. Tears started to roll down her cheeks. I, I don't like killing. Natasha nodded firmly. Yes, I promise. You'll be safe with us. We'll bring you to a place where you can be just like regular children, okay? Seeing as they couldn't stay here, Peter opened a shimmering portal behind them. Come on, let's get you out of here, he said gently, gesturing for the girls to step through. The little ones were hesitant at first, but Natasha's words had sparked a glimmer of hope in their young hearts. One by one, they cautiously approached the portal, taking a leap of faith into the unknown. As the last girl stepped through, Peter could hear a familiar voice called out from the other side. What the hell? My workshop isn't a daycare. Hey you, don't touch that. Ignoring Tony's screams, Peter turned to the kids. All right girls, listen up. That's your new Uncle Tony over there. And he has more money than anyone else in the world. So don't kill him or else he won't be able to buy you stuff, okay? Bye. He gave them a wave before snapping the portal shut, leaving Tony to the wolves. With the young widows safely transported to the Avengers Tower, the group could now continue their assault, knowing that Tony, who was less than thrilled to find a group of young female assassins dumped on his doorstep, would take care of them. Or at least, he'll give them to Pepper, who would most definitely take good care of them. As they advanced through the Red Room, leaving a trail of dazed, yet freed, widows in their wake, they eventually reached the heart of the facility. The tension intensified as they found Drakoff accompanied by an entourage of armed soldiers, with one figure shrouded in a mysterious blue and orange armor. Insert picture of Taskmaster here. Peter's heart skipped a beat when he realized the armored figure was none other than Taskmaster, the mangled, brainwashed daughter of Drakoff himself. I feel for her the most out of everyone here. Her father is a real bastard. He thought, knowing that he could never do such a thing to Lily. It's just unthinkable. Determined to confront Drakoff, who stood surrounded by Russian soldiers, Natasha stepped forward, her eyes blazing with fury. Where do you think you're going? Drakoff sneered at the sight of her. Ah, Natasha, how delightful to see you again. But when he caught sight of Peter beside her, 
He suddenly smiled, putting up a fake persona. Spider-Man, it's an honor to meet you. I'm a very big fan. Question mark. Everyone raised an eyebrow at how quick his tune changed. Since you're here, I'm willing to surrender. Dracoff offers, sweating nervously. Surely we can talk about this, can't we? Maybe we can come to some sort of agreement? After all, the Red Room would be happy to assist the Avengers. With all of his widows neutralized, besides Taskmaster, Dracoff only had his loyal soldiers. And Spider-Man was someone that even he didn't have the confidence to beat. Peter's powers were just too mysterious and unpredictable. One day he would be trapping his enemies in portals and another he could be shooting fire from his hand. Dracoff continued, every word out of his mouth enraging Natasha further. I wouldn't mind bringing the Red Room under the Avengers banner, as long as I remain in control, of course. After all, I am the Red Room. It doesn't exist without me. He motioned to Natasha. She knows this. That's why she tried to kill me, the little traitor. Peter listened as Dracoff tried his best to weave his way out of the situation, finding it rather amusing. Sorry, but I'm not interested in joining forces. I'm more of a take-what-I-want kind of guy, you know? I mean, once you're gone, all of this will belong to me anyway. So why should I bother with keeping you around? He asked, smirking under his mask the whole time. Enraged by Peter's provocative words, a vein bulged on Dracov's forehead. Kill them! He shouted as he turned to run down the hall. With a gesture of his hand, Peter's team rushed forward on his command. Natasha lead the charge, happy with Peter's refusal. Together, they charged at Dracov's remaining soldier, who did their best to follow orders. The room erupted into chaos as the Avengers and their allies took on the soldiers, steamrolling them rather quickly. Taskmaster tried to do as her father said, but before she could even take a step, Peter appeared behind her tapped her on the head. Sleep? He whispered, sending a current of eldritch energy into her, rendering her unconscious in an instant. With Taskmaster and the other guards out of the way, all that was left was Dracoff, who made a desperate attempt to escape to the hangar. However, to his dismay, he found all his ships destroyed, courtesy of Peter Parker. Cornered and desperate, he turned back to face Natasha, his eyes filled with rage and fear. You can't stop me. I'll destroy you and everything you care about. Dracoff snarled, lunging at Natasha with a wild swing. But before he could reach her, a strong hand grabbed his wrist, halting his attack midair. It was Alexei, Natasha's father, and the Red Guardian. His eyes blazed with fury as he stared down at Dracoff. You thought you could get away with all that you've done? Alexei growled, tightening his grip on Dracoff's hand. Arg! Dracoff screamed as his wrist snapped. Betraying me, imprisoning me, enslaving my wife and daughter. Alexei spoke, his grip growing stronger with every word. And now you tried to touch my other daughter. With a swift and powerful punch, Alexei broke Dracoff's ribs, sending him crumbling to the floor, gasping for air. Wait, cough, don't. Without even bending over, Alexei continued to unleash a barrage of blows, stomping his former friend into the hangar floor. Each blow was fueled by the years of suffering and torment Dracoff had inflicted upon him and his loved ones. As the final blows landed, Dracoff was left a bloodied and broken man. Alexei's super strength really did a number on him. His bones were broken, his body was covered in blood, and even his skull was caved in with a small, yet noticeable dent. Peter watched in silence, knowing that this wasn't his fight to interfere in, nor did her care to do so. After all, Dracoff was a man that kidnaps little girls and does God knows what with them. He might as well be on the same level as a pedophile in Peter's eyes. Finally, Alexei stood over Dracoff, panting heavily, but a sense of satisfaction in his eyes. Piece of shit, he spat, turning away from the defeated man. Natasha approached Alexei and silently pulled him into a hug, happy that this was all over. Yelena soon joined in, pulling a very out-of-place looking Melina along with her. Before anyone knew it, a big family hug was underway. Aw. Ned found it very cute. MJ nodded. Yup, they're like one big happy, murdering family. And you ruin the moment, thanks? Ned sighed as he shook his head. It's true though, Peter said as he stood beside them. With Dracoff defeated and the whole Red Room secured, the Avengers regrouped to form a game plan. All prisoners, including Dracoff have already been detained in the tower, leaving only them and a large group of confused and free widows trapped on the ship. We did it, Peter declared. But now we need to figure out what to do with all of these trained assassins, not to mention the ones that aren't here. We'll have to find a way to call them all back. Melina nodded. I can do that. I know how the technology works. I can show you if you want. She offered her assistance. Yeah, sure. 
Peter nodded in return. Can you and Natasha work on calling them back? If you have to, we can send them to a specific location on the ground and I can portal them up here. Yeah, we'll take care of it, Natasha said as she walked off with her mother. When they were gone, Peter turned to Yelena. Now for the more challenging part. Can you call all of the widows to gather here in the hangar? We need to have an important talk. The hangar was abuzz with whispers and hushed conversations as the freed widows gathered, forming a sea of faces that ranged from hopeful to uncertain. They eyed each other, their newfound freedom a tantalizing prospect that seemed almost too good to be true. Standing at the forefront, Spider-Man's presence commanded their attention, his mysterious aura captivating their focus. Peter cleared his throat, projecting his voice to reach every corner of the hangar. The room grew silent, eyes fixed on him in anticipation. With a deep breath, he began to speak, his words resonating with a mix of empathy and charisma. Thank you all for being here today. I know the path that brought you to this moment has been difficult, and I can't even begin to fathom the challenges you've faced. But now, you stand at a crossroads, and the choice is yours to make. A murmur of agreement rippled through the crowd. The widows exchanged glances, curiosity and skepticism warred within them. I offer you two options, Peter continued, his gaze sweeping across the gathered widows. Option 1, if you seek a life free from the shackles that have bound you for far too long, if you yearn to be part of a world where you can have a fresh start, a normal life, then the Avengers will assist you in any way possible. And we have Tony Stark footing the bill, so the sky is the limit. He smirked under his mask, happy to waste more of his friend's money. Whispers filled the air once again, more intense than before. Yelena exchanged a surprised look with Melina, both astounded by Peter's unexpected offer. Option 2, Peter's tone grew firmer, if you feel that your skills, your experiences, and your sense of purpose align with continuing this line of work, but on your own terms, then the Avengers extend their hand as well. We recognize the strengths that each of you possess, and we believe that you deserve the freedom to wield those strengths as you see fit. The crowd seemed divided, wavering between two paths that had never seemed so attainable. Hope and apprehension danced in their eyes as they listened to Peter's words. Here's what I promise you, Peter's voice carried conviction, his sincerity evident in every word. For those who choose option one, we will ensure your transition into society is as smooth as possible. We will provide housing, education, and assistance in finding jobs. You'll have a chance to rebuild your lives, free from your past as a slave for the Red Room. Taking a moment for them to process his words, Peter motioned to the left side of the hangar. If that's something you'd be interested in, then please stand on the left. The left side of the hangar seemed to grow more populated as the widows considered the idea of a life beyond the Red Room. On the other hand, Peter continued, gesturing to the right this time. For those who choose option two, you will have the opportunity to become part of something bigger. You will become agents like Black Widow, who's been a part of the Avengers since its inception. And unlike Dracoff, who I doubt treated any of you humanely, we pay a very generous salary, provide a free apartment in the Avengers Tower, and much more. Basically, we'll treat you like human beings, with days off, vacations, sick days, insurance, and just about anything else you can think of. The right side of the hangar saw a surge of movement as more widows leaned towards this second path. It seemed that some of them, despite their history, felt a sense of empowerment and purpose that resonated with them. Finally, Peter gestured to the left. Once again, if you wish to choose option one, please move to the left side of the hangar. If option two resonates with you, stand on the right, a tense moment lingered as the remaining widows exchanged glances, weighing their options. And then, as if breaking a spell, the crowd began to shift. Some moved confidently to the left, eager to embrace a new life, while others hesitated before making their way to the right, intrigued by the opportunity to use their skills for good. The left side of the hangar gradually filled with widows who chose to seek a different path, a chance at normalcy. Their faces bore expressions of determination, hope rekindled in their eyes. Meanwhile, the right side became a testament to the bravery and resilience of those who believed in their ability to rewrite their stories. A sense of unity seemed to emanate from this group, an understanding that they were taking ownership of their own destinies. Peter watched as the crowd divided, a complex mixture of emotions evident on their faces. Yelena stood among the widows who had chosen to join the Avengers, a sense of purpose igniting within her. Not to mention the fact that she would be joining her sister, which was an added bonus. Peter nodded his head, happy to see that around 60% of the Widows chose to join the Avengers, which was more than he initially expected. Okay, since everyone has made their choices, we can start getting the ball rolling. Why don't all of you go and pack any sort of belongings you may have and meet here again in an hour's time? That should give me enough time to prepare everything. 
The hangar emptied gradually as the freed widows dispersed to gather their meager belongings. Soon, only Peter, Yelena, Alexei, MJ, and Ned remained, standing amid the echoes of choices that had been made. It was a pivotal moment, one that carried the weight of a new beginning for these women who had spent their lives as mindless weapons. As the hangar doors closed behind the last widow, Melina and Natasha returned, their expressions a mixture of weariness and relief. Melina cleared her throat, addressing the group. We've managed to contact all the active widows who weren't present. They'll be arriving at my farmhouse over the next few days, depending on their locations around the world. Peter nodded in gratitude. Thank you, both of you. Your help means a lot. As the conversation turned to the two newly returned figures, Yelena moved closer to Natasha. She glanced at her sister, excited to reveal the big news. Hey, she said, sounding a little nervous. I chose to join the Avengers. Natasha's gaze flickered toward Yelena, a mix of surprise, pride, and concern reflected in her eyes. You did? Yelena nodded. Yeah. I mean, I've always wanted to be like you. And now, with everything that's happened, I want to be with you. This is my chance. She knew her sister didn't want this but it wasn't her choice to make. Natasha's lips twitched into a small smile. She placed a hand on Yelena's shoulder, her voice gentle. Just promise me you'll be careful, okay? This isn't a life I would have wished for you. Yelena met her sister's gaze, her own expression determined. I know, but it's my choice. I want this. The sisters shared a moment of understanding before Peter's voice drew their attention. Speaking of choices, he said, turning to Melina, I offer you the same options as the other widows. You can choose to live a normal life with our assistance or join the Avengers in a role that suits you. Melina's gaze shifted between Peter and her daughter, her decision wrought with consideration. After a pause, she looked back at Peter. I'm willing to join the Avengers, but I won't be going on missions. I've grown tired of that life and I'm not as young as I look. Peter nodded in understanding. Of course, that's completely understandable. I never intended for you to go on missions anyway. Your expertise will be valuable in other areas. A sense of relief seemed to wash over Melina as she made her choice, wishing to stay close to her daughters. Natasha raised an eyebrow inquisitively, unaware of her mother's intentions. Peter turned to Natasha, addressing her with a note of seriousness. Natasha, as you know, the widows will need a new leader, someone they can look up to. So, I'll be creating a new branch within the Avengers, called Nightingale. They'll operate in a more behind-the-scenes manner, similar to S.H.I.E.L.D., but without public knowledge. And you'll be the director... Natasha's eyes widened in surprise, her mind struggling to process the implications of this unexpected responsibility. Director? But, I didn't. Peter cut her off with a small smile. You don't have to make a decision right away. Just think about it. You've earned this opportunity, Natasha. Yelena, however, was not one to hold back. She frowned at Peter's choice of name. Why Nightingale? Shouldn't they be named after something? I don't know. More related to spiders? We are black widows, after all. Peter chuckled softly, explaining, The nightingale is a bird that suffers when captured and confined, but it thrives when free and able to sing its melodious songs in its natural habitat. Now that they're free, I hope they'll thrive like the nightingale. Natasha sighed, her gaze shifting between Peter and Yelena. I can't refuse, can I? She muttered, a mixture of exasperation and amusement in her voice. Fine, I'll give it a try. But don't expect me to be half as good as someone like Fury. Peter shrugged nonchalantly. You can do whatever you want. No pressure. Natasha rolled her eyes, but a small smile tugged at the corner of her lips. Okay, fine. I'll give it a shot. Good, now I'll appoint your first subordinate and assistant director, Melina whatever the hell your Russian last name is. Congratulations, Peter said, shocking both mother and daughter. Feeling left out, Yelena stepped forward, a noticeable pout on her lip. What about me? Peter shrugged once again. Ask your sister. She's free to give you any position she wants. I only made your mother the assistant director because she has the most experience out of all the widows. She'll be a massive help to Natasha. Turning to her sister, Yelena starred a hole in the side of Natasha's head, waiting expectantly for a cool high-level title. What about me? Suddenly, Alexei spoke up. Can I join the Avengers? The hangar was silent in shock as the group absorbed Alexei's unexpected request to join the Avengers. Peter's brow furrowed, a mixture of surprise and curiosity evident in his eyes. You want to join the Avengers? Even though Captain America is a part of the team. Alexei crossed his arms, his expression resolute. I do. I may not like that star-spangled douche, but I won't let my hate for him, or your capitalist regime, get in the way of being with my family again. Peter arched an eyebrow, a faint smile playing on his lips. Your family, huh? 
He was more than happy to see Natasha get a happy ending like this. Natasha, Yelena, and Melina exchanged surprised glances, astonishment washing over their faces at Alexei's words. The rugged man looked down at his feet, his voice uncharacteristically soft. I've spent years regretting my actions, especially the way I treated all of you. I let my own ego blind me to what truly mattered. Now, I want to make amends and stay close to you all. A warm smile spread across Natasha's face, her heart softening at Alexei's sincerity. It feels like I'm dreaming, she said gently. I wonder how Steve will react to this. Alexei huffed, a frown playing out on his lip. We don't use that name in this family. It leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Natasha raised an eyebrow. What am I supposed to call him then? She asked, clearly amused by her father's antic. American scum, star-spangled sissy, Yankee doodle dandy boy, freedom faker, shield-swinging weakling, liberty lapdog, capitalist swine. Without missing a beat, Alexei started unloading all sorts of hateful nicknames. Peter chuckled in amusement. Welcome to the Avengers, Alexei. The days that followed were a whirlwind of activity. Peter worked tirelessly to help the widows transition into their new lives, leveraging his connections to streamline the process. Government officials, influenced by his personal rapport with the president, expedited the paperwork required for granting them brand new identities as U.S. citizens. Each widow received a birth certificate, social security number, and ID card. For those who chose to join the Avengers, Peter's meticulous planning ensured they had their own apartments within the tower. As for the widows who opted for a civilian life, he placed them in areas they desired, with a free home, recommendations for jobs, and a financial cushion to begin anew. Tony Stark's generosity knew no bounds. God bless his soul, Peter thought, excitedly anticipating the look on Tony's face when he sees the bill. As the days passed, Peter finally met with the widows at Melina's farmhouse. He freed them and gave them the same offer as the others, tripling the staff of the Nightingales in a single day. Though Natasha's role as director came with its challenges, Peter supported her every step of the way. He admired her tenacity and knew that she was more than capable of shouldering the responsibility. During this time, Peter also took control of the Red Room's assets, including the airship, which he officially adding to the Avengers fleet. He was beginning to wonder if he should remodel the ship into a mobile Avengers base. I would have to upgrade the tech thought. After all, even the shittiest spaceship in our fleet is more advanced. Peter saved those thoughts for another time. The real challenge came in dealing with the Red Room's mind control technology and data. Knowing its potential for manipulation and destruction, Peter made the very easy call to keep it away from everyone, including his family and the Avengers. He couldn't risk any misuse of accidents with such dangerous tech. Melina's stash of mind control tech was confiscated as well, and she was banned from recreating anything of the sort ever again. It was just too dangerous. Peter even searched the widows as they left the Red Room, making sure they didn't take anything on their way out. Even his team wasn't immune to such treatment. Everyone was searched. With every passing day, the widows began to find their footing. Some adjusted to their new roles as Avengers, training alongside Natasha and embracing their newfound purpose. Others explored their civilian lives, creating families, attending schools, building up their careers. Once it all began set in, every widow began to realize how grateful they were for the second chance they had been given. As Peter observed the progress from afar, he couldn't help but feel a sense of accomplishment. He had orchestrated a new chapter for these women, guiding them towards a future that was no longer shackled by their past. But man, Peter thought, his mind descending into the gutter. If I was some evil villain, I would have definitely taken those widows under my wing. Personally, as those thoughts came, suddenly, an image appeared in Peter's mind. It was MJ. Why does this always happen? Did she curse me? He wondered as he took in MJ's demonic form. Her once radiant beauty is now twisted into a menacing visage. Her skin is a deep shade of obsidian giving off an otherworldly sheen. Her eyes, which were once warm and expressive, now glow with an intense and malevolent crimson light. The pupils are slitted, like those of a predatory animal. Her hair, once flowing and vibrant, now takes on a life of its own, writhing and shifting as if it were made of serpents. It's a chaotic mix of deep black and fiery red, like molten lava frozen in time. As she moves, the hair seems to flicker and writhe as if it's alive. Her delicate features are now sharp and angular, with pronounced cheekbones and a pointed, sinister smile that reveals gleaming, razor-sharp teeth. Her attire is a blend of elegant yet eerie, with flowing robes that seem to meld and shift like shadows, giving the illusion of her form being constantly in flux. Her hands have long, claw-like nails that are as black as her soul, and they drip with an ominous, greenish venom. 
Her aura exudes an aura of darkness, making her presence both alluring and terrifying. What the hell? Peter shook his head, dispelling the evil creature from his mind. It's getting stronger. As the day's tasks drew to a close, Peter let out a satisfied sigh, looking around his office within the Avengers Tower. It had been a productive day, and the completion of the Black Widow business felt like a significant milestone. He trusted Natasha to handle the Nightingales and her new division. It was time for him to return to his own life, if only for a little while. I want to be a lazy bastard for at least a week, Peter thought, ready to head home and become one with his bed. Just as he was about to head home, the soothing voice of Jarvis echoed through the room's speakers. Sir, I have a visitor requesting your audience. Peter rolled his eyes in annoyance, releasing a sigh of frustration. Who is it this time, Jarvis? Because if it's another government official, then just send them home. The AI's response carried a hint of amusement. Actually, it is King Chaka of Wakanda. Peter's interest was piqued immediately. His eyebrows shot up and he leaned against his desk. King Chaka? Send him up, please. He barely had time to prepare himself before the door to his office opened, and in walked Chaka, dressed in the regal attire of a diplomat. The king's presence commanded respect and held an air of wisdom that was unmistakable. Yo, what's up? Peter greeted with a nod, throwing away all formalities. Does Wakanda need help with something? Chaka returned the nod with a solemn expression, unperturbed by Peter's casual greeting. It is good to see you. I come with an important decision that has been reached after much deliberation. Peter leaned forward, his curiosity peaked. Please, enlighten me. Chaka clasped his hands behind his back, his posture regal as he spoke. After careful consideration and discussions with the tribal leaders of Wakanda, I have come to accept your offer to join the Avengers Council. Peter blinked, momentarily caught off guard. He had made that offer during his visit to Wakanda, but it seemed like a distant memory now. Still, he recovered quickly, his surprise giving way to a sense of intrigue. Are you telling me that it took you this long to come to a decision? Chaka inclined his head slightly. Indeed, it is a decision that was not taken lightly. After all, Wakanda is a very introverted nation, but we recognize the importance of unity and collaboration. A small smile tugged at the corners of Peter's lips. I'm happy that you've chosen to accept. I'm sure you'll be an invaluable addition to the council, he said as he turned to the stacks of paperwork on his desk. Unlike some who dump all of the work onto me, Chaka's eyes held a glint of amusement. Thank you. As you've said before, the world is changing and so should Wakanda. I believe that together, we can work towards a more harmonious world. Peter nodded in agreement. Absolutely. I'll convene the council tomorrow and have a vote. If it passes, you'll be an official member of the Avengers Council, so you'll have to attend. Chaka's expression remained composed, his voice steady. I'll be there. Know that I take this responsibility seriously, and I am committed to making the council's decisions for the greater good, for not just Wakanda, but the world as well. No need to lay it on so thick with me. Save all of that politician talk for the council meeting tomorrow, Peter said dismissively, eliciting a laugh from the old monarch. Chaka couldn't keep the amused smile from his face. I see you haven't changed since our last meeting, Peter shrugged. Nope, not one bit, he said, leaning back in his chair. So, are you going to remain king after this? Or is Chala stepping up? If everything goes well tomorrow, then I'll step down and Chala will take my place, he said, a complex look on his face. I only hope that he's ready, because I know that I wasn't when it was my time. He'll be fine, Peter shrugged. Besides, if he messes up, then his daddy can come bail him out, like all the other rich kids. He smirked under his mask. The Avengers will have your back, so don't worry too much. Chaka paused for a moment before a relieved smile returned to his face. Thank you, but let's hope he doesn't need us. The following day brought about a sense of anticipation within the walls of the Avengers Tower. The council members were gathering for a pivotal meeting that held the potential to shape the course of events to come. Tony Stark, Nick Fury, Charles Xavier, Eric Lencher, and of course, Peter, all sat around the table, the holographic interface illuminating their faces. Tony leaned forward, fingers dancing across the console embedded in the table's surface. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get this show on the road. After all, I don't want to be here any longer than I have to. Today we're here to vote on a new member joining the council. Fury, as usual, was the first to speak. Any objections? He asked, scanning each of their faces. Charles spoke up next, his calm demeanor contrasting with Fury's intensity. No objections from me. Eric nodded in agreement, his magnetic presence palpable. None from me either. Though I do hope we'll be able to trade for some vibranium after this. A greedy glint flashed across his eyes. 
Peter chimed in with a casual thumbs up. I'm all for it, he said before turning to Eric. As for trading with Wakanda, I doubt they'll do that anytime soon. You'll probably have to wait until they get a bit more comfortable with us. Tony looked around the table. Great. Then let's put it to a vote. He initiated the voting process, each member selecting their choice on the holographic panel before them. Moments later, the results appeared in a holographic tally and the vote was unanimous. Tony grinned, leaning back in his chair. Congratulations, Chaka. You're officially an Avenger. The door to the council room slid open, and King Chaka walked in, regal in his bearing as always. He acknowledged the council members with a nod, his expression a mixture of pride and humility. I am honored by your trust in me, Tony gestured to the empty seat beside him. Take a seat, Chaka settled into the chair, his gaze steady as he met the eyes of his fellow council members. I will do my best to contribute positively. As Chaka sat down, Tony's fingers danced across the console again. A holographic globe appeared above the table, displaying Earth in all its splendor. The globe zoomed in, honing in on a particular region, the hidden nation of Wakanda. The image was both awe-inspiring and alarming, especially for Chaka. Chaka's eyes widened, his gaze fixed on the hologram. How? How did you find Wakanda? Is this live? He shouted upon noticing the time and date on the hologram. Tony smirked, his eyes glinting mischievously. I upgraded my satellites with a bunch of alien tech. Cool, huh? Peter chimed in. Yeah, and it's only a matter of time before someone else's tech gets better too. Chaka's brow furrowed, concern etching his features. Our isolation has been our strength for centuries. To be discovered like this? Peter leaned forward, his voice earnest. Chaka, the world is changing faster than we can anticipate. Technology is growing exponentially. As I've already told you before, soon enough, someone else will stumble upon Wakanda. We're just lucky it was us this time around. Chaka nodded slowly, his mind grappling with the implications. How long do we have before others find out? Tony leaned back, his expression serious. In my professional opinion, a few years tops, Peter leaned back as well, his tone casual despite the gravity of the situation. We're living in a time where secrets are harder to keep. People are curious, they're going to find out eventually. Chaka's shoulders sagged slightly, the weight of his responsibilities evident. Then we must prepare. Tony nodded, his eyes locked onto Chaka's. We can help with that. We've been through our fair share of controversies and media frenzies. We know how to handle public scrutiny. Peter leaned forward, resting his arms on the table. If you're open to it, we could call a press conference and reveal the existence of Wakanda ourselves. You could explain everything on your own terms. This way, no one can twist the news before us. Chaka considered their words, a thoughtful expression on his face. While I appreciate your willingness to help, the decision to reveal ourselves does not lie solely with me. It involves our tribal leaders, and they're all isolationists. Not a single one of them would ever agree to that. Peter shrugged, a wry smile on his lips. Well, if they're not up for it, then we can only leave it up to fate. Chaka nodded, his gaze steady. Indeed. We'll have to wait and prepare for the worst. As the meeting concluded, Chaka rose from his seat, a sense of determination in his eyes. Thank you for your assistance. I will consider our options carefully. Peter smiled under his mask. Now, if no one has anything else to report, I believe that concludes our meeting dash. Tony abruptly hopped out of his chair. Oh, thank God. He muttered as he paced out of the room, ready to lock himself in his workshop once again. Chaka chuckled in amusement. He reminds me of my daughter. He said before leaving his chair as well. Speaking of my family, I must return to Wakanda to prepare for my son's inauguration. Remembering what's supposed to happen on Chala's inauguration day, Peter called out behind Chaka. Don't forget to send us an invite. Of course, of course. Chaka replied as he left the room. The council chamber slowly emptied as the members departed, each lost in their thoughts and tasks for the day. Alone in the room, Peter leaned back in his chair, stretching his arms above his head. I wonder if Killmonger will still be able to get into Wakanda? After all, Klau is already off the board, so he would need to find another way in. As he rose from his seat, his thoughts were interrupted by the sound of footsteps approaching. The door to the chamber swung open, and in walked Deadpool, his red and black suit in stark contrast to the muted tones of the room. Hey, Spidey! He exclaimed, arms wide as he strolled in. Long time no see, huh? Peter sighed. Hey, Wade. Yeah, been kind of busy lately. Deadpool crossed his arms, his masked face twisting into an exaggerated pout. Busy schmizzy. You disappeared on me, buddy. Where the hell have you been? Peter chuckled, a hint of amusement in his eyes. 
Sorry about that. Things got a little hectic. I was dash, Deadpool waved a hand dismissively, interrupting before Peter could explain. Eh whatever. You're here now. And speaking of being here, I found out who Kingpin is. Peter sighed once again, knowing he wouldn't be headed home as he had hoped. You did? How? Deadpool's grin was practically audible in his voice. Let's just say I've been doing a little detective work. Spent the last month or so hunting down anyone connected to Kingpin until I finally got a lead on his true identity. Peter leaned forward, feigning interest. So, who is Kingpin? Deadpool's tone was triumphant. Wilson Fisk, my friend. The big guy himself. Peter did his best to sound shocked. Wow. Wilson Fisk. I should have known. Deadpool looked smug with himself. I know, I'm amazing for figuring it out. But here's the fun part. Remember our plan to take him down together? I just want to be lazy. Why won't anyone let me? Peter shouted in his head, utterly defeated. Of course. I assume, you want to go after Kingpin now? Deadpool nodded, his excitement palpable. Exactly. And I'm inviting you to come along for the ride. We can murder and defile his corpse together. What a drag. Peter sighed once again, embodying his inner Shikamaru Nara. I'm in, minus the defiling part. But first, we need to organize a team for this. Deadpool rolled his eyes dramatically. Ugh, come on. We don't need a whole team. It's just Fisk. Besides, they'll just interrupt our budding bromance. That's even more reason to invite them. Peter held up a finger. Now hold on a sec. I know a few people who'd probably want to be involved. Ignoring Deadpool's protests, Peter pulled out his phone and quickly typed out a message to Daredevil and Jessica Jones. Sending out a couple of texts. He explained, eyes on his screen. Deadpool let out an exaggerated sigh. Fine, fine. Text your buddies. But can we go already? Peter shook his head. Hold on a second, I'm almost done. Just as he was about to put his phone away, he paused, a thought striking him. Wait, there's one more person I want to reach out to. Deadpool groaned, flopping into a nearby chair. You're killing me, Spidey. Ignoring Deadpool's antics, Peter stashed his phone away and opened up a portal. Hopefully, he's in Harlem already. If not, then I'll just have to wait, I guess. He thought as he stepped through the portal. Deadpool's eyes widened, surprise evident beneath his mask. Hey, wait for me. He shouted, rushing to follow Peter through. Harlem a swirling portal shimmered into existence on the bustling streets of Harlem, and out stepped Spider-Man, followed closely by Deadpool. The appearance of the two heroes caused pedestrians to stop in their tracks, their expressions a mix of awe and disbelief. Spider-Man gave a casual wave to the onlookers before leading the way into a dive bar named Loop. As they entered the bar, the atmosphere shifted. Conversations died down, and all eyes turned towards the two newcomers. The place was alive with energy, but it fell into a hushed silence as Spider-Man and Deadpool made their way inside. Behind the bar stood a tall and imposing figure, his muscles practically bursting through his clothes. This was Luke Cage, the man Peter had come to see. He glanced up from his work, his expression wary but curious. The room seemed to hold its breath as he regarded the unexpected visitors. Insert picture of Luke Cage here. Ignoring the odd looks from the patrons, Peter and Wade took two empty seats at the bar. Wade leaned in, his tone overly enthusiastic. Hey Barky, two mojitos for me and my husband. Inside Luke's bar, the air was thick with tension as the patrons gawked at the masked figures who had just walked in. Luke Cage, the bar's owner and resident powerhouse, observed the scene with a mix of caution and curiosity. He wiped a glass clean, his eyes briefly meeting Peter's before shifting away. Wade's exuberant order for drinks broke the silence, and Luke began to pour the requested mojitos. As the glasses were placed before them, Peter caught Luke's eye again. Mind if we have a quick chat? Luke hesitated, clearly not interested in whatever they had to say. He turned to the customer beside him, asking if he needed a refill. The customer waved him off, seemingly more interested in whatever Spider-Man had to say. Seeing that Luke wouldn't listen, Peter leaned in slightly, his tone low. We're here with an offer, Luke. How would you like to join the Avengers? The murmurs from the patrons grew louder as the implications of Peter's words began to sink in. Luke tensed, looking from Peter to Wade and back again. He glanced around the room, perhaps gauging the atmosphere before finally answering. I'm flattered, but I'm not interested, Luke replied, his voice steady and measured. Peter didn't back down. Listen Luke, I've known about you for a while. You've got powers, you've got the heart to protect your neighborhood. But with the Avengers behind you, you could do so much more. We want you on our team. The tension in the room escalated as Luke remained silent, his brow furrowed in thought. The patrons exchanged glances, some recognizing the name Avengers and realizing the gravity of the situation. 
A few murmurs of surprise rippled through the crowd. Look man, give him an answer so we can go. We got shit to do. Places to visit and people to kill dash as Wade spoke. Peter's elbow found its way into his ribs. Ugh. I mean people to apprehend. Luke let out a tired sigh, his gaze shifting from the two heroes to the glass in his hand. The bars closed, folks. Time to clear out. As if on cue, the patrons began to disperse, albeit reluctantly. Luke's authority in the bar was clear, and no one dared to defy him. Soon, the bar emptied out, leaving only Luke, Peter, and Wade. What do you guys want? Luke said dryly, his tone laced with a mix of weariness and annoyance. Yeah, I have powers, but I'm not interested. I like my life here, in Harlem. Peter leaned back, taking a sip of his drink. And we respect that. But joining the Avengers doesn't mean you have to change who you are or where you live. We just want you to use your abilities to make a bigger impact. Luke poured himself a shot of whiskey, his expression guarded. I'm not interested in being a world-saving hero. I've got my own way of doing things, and it works for me. Peter nodded, his mask hiding his understanding smile. That's fine. We're not here to change you. We're here to support you. Luke took the shot, his gaze locking onto Peter's. And what's in it for you? Nothing, we're heroes. It's what we do. Peter answered with a shrug. Right? Luke didn't sound convinced. We've got resources, funding, technology, Peter explained. With us behind you, you could do even more for Harlem. Start a charity, improve your crime-fighting efforts, make a real difference. Luke sighed, rubbing a hand over his bald head. You know, sometimes I just want to live my life in peace. And you can, Peter assured him. Joining the Avengers doesn't mean you have to give up your life either. It just means you'll have some backup when things get tough. Luke eyed Peter for a moment, skepticism evident in his gaze. He downed the shot of whiskey before looking back at Peter. Fine, let's say I'm interested. What's the catch? Peter smiled, his voice earnest. No catch. Just join us on a mission. See how we work. If you like it, great. If not, no hard feelings. Luke considered his words, a mix of curiosity and doubt playing across his features. He set the shot glass down with a thunk. So, what's the mission? Peter's expression turned serious as he leaned in, lowering his voice. We're going after Wilson Fisk, the kingpin. Luke's eyes narrowed at the mention of the kingpin's name. Kingpin, huh? I've heard that name before. He's the source of all the guns and drugs that flow into Harlem. Exactly, Peter nodded. And we're going after him tonight. You in? Luke's fingers drummed against the bar's surface as he thought it over. All right, I'm in. But I've got one condition. Peter raised an eyebrow, intrigued. What's that? You guys better keep up, Luke said, a hint of a challenge in his voice. I'm not slowing down for anyone. A smile tugged at the corner of Peter's lips. Deal. On the bustling streets of New York City, a swirling portal materialized, revealing Peter, Wade, and Luke stepping out onto the pavement. The towering presence of Fisk Tower loomed before them, casting a shadow over the surroundings. Luke eyed the portal nervously. So, that was odd. Just as Peter was about to respond, a familiar figure emerged from the shadows nearby. Daredevil, clad in his signature red suit, stood with his arms crossed. Jessica Jones leaned against a nearby lamppost, her casual demeanor contrasting with Daredevil's more intense stance. Daredevil's voice held a hint of disbelief as he spoke. So, you guys really found out who Kingpin is? Wade chimed in, his tone mischievous. Yup, I had to hunt down his goons for a whole month before someone told me his name. I've been trying to bring him down for months. Daredevil admits, annoyed at his own lack of progress. Peter nodded. Well, sometimes it takes a maniac to find a maniac. Wade gasped in offense. Is that how you speak about your bestest buddy? Daredevil's gaze shifted to Wade, his frustration evident. Can we focus on the mission, please? Peter cleared his throat, shifting the attention to himself. All right, let's get on the same page. I've got a proposal. The assembled heroes turned their attention to Peter, their curiosity peak. Peter continued, his tone earnest. I'm planning to build a team for small-time hero work in the city. A team that focuses on the neighborhoods, the people, and the issues that might not make the front page. Basically, you'll handle the crimes that fall through the cracks. Wade's eyebrows shot up, his tone incredulous. No no no. Deadpool doesn't do teamwork, you hear. Peter ignored Wade, a confident smile hidden under his mask. And this is the starting roster. Daredevil, Deadpool, Luke, and Jessica. You're going to be the heroes that people can count on when they're not sure who else to turn to. Jessica raised an eyebrow, her skepticism evident. So, we're a team now? Peter nodded again. Yep, consider this your debut mission. Wade's gaze shifted between the faces around him, his eyes wide. Hey, wait a minute. No one told me about this. 
I thought this was just going to be a bro's night out. Peter grinned, his tone teasing. Surprise. Daredevil's lips twitched beneath his mask, his stance relaxing slightly. All right, let's worry about this team shit later. What's the plan? Peter nodded in agreement. I'm tagging along, but I won't help you unless it's absolutely necessary. This is your show. If one of you wants to take the lead, then feel free. Act as if I'm not even here. Got it. Daredevil, Deadpool, and Jessica answered simultaneously, each vying for the leading role. The group moved through the sleek and opulent lobby of Fisk Tower, their footsteps echoing in the silence. Despite the tension in the air, there was an underlying sense of camaraderie among the heroes. As they entered the building, the question of leadership lingered unspoken between them. Daredevil, Deadpool, and Jessica each cast glances at one another, a silent contest of wills to determine who would take charge. Yet, no one spoke up to claim the role. Instead, they continued forward, ascending the tower without a designated leader. Peter followed them from a distance, his steps silent as he manipulated the building's power with a whispered incantation. Lights flickered and went out, plunging the interior into darkness. Even the emergency power remained stubbornly dormant, trapping Fisk and his guards in a world of shadows. On their way up the tower, the group encountered armed guards, their guns trained on the heroes. The absence of a leader was evident as they charged in without a plan, each relying on their own unique skills and instincts. The fight was messy, with shots echoing through the air and fists flying. I expected better, Peter thought with a shake of his head. Deadpool's sword slashed through the darkness, Luke's impenetrable body deflecting all attacks, Jessica's strength sending guards flying, and Daredevil's agility allowing him to weave throughout the battle. The chaos was palpable, the sounds of struggle echoing through the halls as the heroes fought for their lives. Bullets ricocheted off walls, shattered glass rained down, and sparks erupted from damaged equipment. Despite the lack of coordination, in the end, their individual expertise and powers allowed them to overpower their adversaries. Finally, they emerged on the top floor, finding themselves in a lavish penthouse apartment. The tension in the room was palpable as they spread out, searching for any sign of Fisk. Deadpool kicked open doors, Jessica examined the living area, and Daredevil navigated through the shadows. Peter and Luke stood back, watching the team with keen interest. Peter's enhanced senses picked up the faint sound of breathing from one corner of the room, obscured by a large bookshelf. Daredevil paused, his head tilting as he honed in on the noise as well. Daredevil gestured for Jessica to join him. She approached, her brow furrowing in concentration. What is it? Daredevil's voice was low. Listen. Jessica's ears strained, and then she heard it too, a rhythmic, shallow breathing. Her eyes widened, and she gestured toward the shelf. Behind there, without hesitation, Jessica's superhuman strength came into play. She positioned herself in front of the shelf and exerted force. Metal groaned and bent under her might as she tore away a thick, concealed door, dropping books everywhere. The hidden compartment was revealed, and within it stood Wilson Fisk, his face contorted with fury and fear. Fisk held a shotgun in his hands, his finger twitching on the trigger. Wade! He yelled as he caught a glimpse of Deadpool before opening fire, the deafening blast filling the room. The heroes scattered, seeking cover as bullets tore through the air. Well, not all of them. In the chaos, while everyone was jumping out of the way, Luke stood at the front, deflecting every bullet he could with his body alone. With him there, not a single bullet hit the team. Finally, Fisk's shotgun clicked empty, and the room fell into an eerie stillness. The penthouse apartment was now a scene of destruction, shattered glass, and ricocheted bullet holes. Fisk stood there, with nothing but an empty shotgun and his bare hands to defend himself. Peter stepped up. I'd give up if I were you, he says as he gestures to Wade. Because my friend here is very keen on cutting you into pieces. So, it's in your best interest not to give him that opportunity. Spidey. Wade whined like a child, but suddenly a voice appeared in Wade's head. Peter used some minor telepathy to project his thoughts over to his kill-happy friend. Just wait until we're alone with him. I want to give Luke a good impression of us. If we kill him now, he may leave the Avengers. Or worse, he'll tell the news. Fine. Wade huffed as he sheathed his blades. Fisk looked at his assailants, sizing them up. All right, I surrender, he said, knowing he couldn't win this fight. I'll leave it to my lawyers. They'll have a much better chance than me. After the exhilarating takedown of Wilson Fisk, the newly assembled team of Daredevil, Deadpool, Luke, and Jessica went their separate ways, each with their own thoughts and motivations. They may not have been a perfectly coordinated unit, but there was a certain bond forming among them, forged through a night of chaotic teamwork. Well, maybe not all of them. Deadpool didn't seem to mesh well with the group, but time would tell whether that could be fixed or not. 
Hours later, in a dimly lit cell within the Avengers Tower, Peter walked up and opened the door to Kingpin's cell, letting Deadpool step inside. The air was heavy with tension as Kingpin glared at them, his confidence clearly shaken after their earlier confrontation. All right, you clowns got what you wanted, Kingpin growled in annoyance. I demand to see my lawyer. Deadpool's laughter echoed in the small space as he brandished his dual swords. Kingpin's eyes widened in realization that this wasn't going to be a conventional interrogation. With a sadistic grin, Deadpool leaned in close, his voice dripping with malicious amusement. Oh, we're not going by the book today, big guy. Kingpin's protests turned into stuttered words as he backed away, his back hitting the cold concrete wall of his cell. Deadpool advanced, his blades glinting in the dim light. Why you can't do this? Kingpin stammered, desperation seeping into his voice. I have rights. Deadpool chuckled. You know what's funny? So do I. The right to stab you if I feel like it? As Deadpool raised his swords, Kingpin's eyes widened in terror. But just as the blades were about to pierce his flesh, Deadpool's grip on the weapons shifted. Instead of the sharp edges meeting their mark, Deadpool wrapped his arms around Kingpin in a tight hug, holding him close. Kingpin's confusion was evident, but before he could react, Deadpool shushed him softly like a mother comforting a child. It's okay, big guy. I've been waiting for this moment for so long. Let it all out. Kingpin's fear transformed into a cautious hope as he began to babble apologies, his words a jumbled mess of regret and fear. Deadpool held him tightly, even going as far as to pat his back soothingly. Peter, standing by the door, shook his head in disbelief, muttering under his breath. This guy is seriously messed up. As Kingpin continued to apologize, Deadpool's voice took on an eerily soothing tone. There, there, buddy. Let it all out. You're safe now. This is a safe space. Kingpin's eyes widened as he felt a sharp pain in his back, and his words were cut off with a gasp of agony. Looking down, he saw both of Deadpool's blades embedded in his flesh, the tips poking through his chest. His hope shattered, and his eyes locked onto Deadpool's with a mix of shock and betrayal. Deadpool's maniacal grin widened as he leaned in, his voice a twisted mockery of comfort. Oh don't worry, it'll all be over soon. Just close your eyes and let the pain fade away. As Kingpin's life force ebbed away, Deadpool finally released him, letting his body slump to the ground. The mercenary pulled his blades free, wincing at the shallow wounds he'd inflicted upon himself in his enthusiasm. However, his healing factor quickly kicked in, closing the wounds within moments. Peter shook his head in disbelief as he approached Deadpool. You really are something else, Wade? Deadpool shrugged, wiping his blades clean. Meh, it's more fun when they think you'll forgive them and let them go. Kingpin's lifeless body lay in the cell, his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. Despite the gruesome end he met, his demise was a twisted mixture of Deadpool's insanity and calculated ruthlessness. Besides, he deserved it. Deadpool muttered, as if justifying his actions to himself. He almost took Vanessa from me, Peter sighed, glancing at the lifeless figure on the ground. Yeah, whatever. He shrugged uncaringly as he waved his hand, vanishing Kingpin alongside any evidence of his death. Let's go get some food. I haven't eaten all day. Wade perked up as he followed Peter out of the cell. Oh, I know a good place. They have these little tacos with a tiny sombrero on top. Weeks had passed since Kingpin's death. In Camartage, amidst the serene landscape and hidden away from the world's chaos, Peter stood with a watchful eye, observing his small family practicing the mystical arts alongside a crowd of other students. Lily, his young daughter, was showing an uncanny affinity for magic, her tiny hands shaping reality with the guidance of the sling ring. Beside her, MJ smiled with pride as she encouraged their daughter's progress alongside her own. But his focus wasn't solely on his family. Peter's gaze occasionally shifted to Doctor Strange, who always seemed to attend the same classes as his family. Peter couldn't help but feel that fate had a role to play in the convergence of their paths. Usually, he would force a convergence, but this time it was like fate was giving him a helping hand. As he observed, the Ancient One approached him. The two of them shared a silent understanding, a camaraderie formed through their shared experiences and future knowledge. Peter turned his attention to the Ancient One, his expression softening as he spoke. Have you heard any news of Kaecilius and his followers? The Ancient One shook her head, her gaze distant. No, they've been quiet since their little rebellion. Peter's brow furrowed, a look of skepticism in his eyes. Is that so? Of course, you wouldn't tell me either way, would you? The Ancient One's lips curved into a gentle smile as she regarded Peter. No, I wouldn't. Peter shook his head in exasperation. Then I better prepare for whenever he rears his ugly head, shouldn't I? Turning away from his suicidal teacher, Peter eyed his family. Lily, MJ, that's enough for today. 
It's time for your private lessons. Instantly, all eyes turned to Lily and MJ, jealous looks clearly cemented on all of the students' faces. After all, none of them will ever get the chance to learn from the direct disciple of the Ancient One, let alone the Ancient One herself. It was truly shocking to learn that nepotism existed even in the magical side of the world. Wait! Suddenly, a familiar voice called out. Stepping up beside MJ and Lily, Dr. Strange looked at Peter with imploring eyes. Please teach me as well. He begged, deeply bowing toward Peter. Although Strange has learned a lot during his time in Kamartage, most of it has been boring group classes and reading homework, which he's already finished weeks ago. And since his classes weren't getting any more interesting, he decided to take a chance and ask Peter to teach him. In the beginning, Dr. Strange thought of Peter as just another teenager, but after spending some time in Kamartage, he began to realize just how respected and skilled he supposedly was. Masters and students alike always seem to have nothing but praise to say about him, which has slowly built up Peter's image in Strange's head. Smirking over at the Ancient One, who did not look pleased, Peter nodded his head. Sure, you can join us for today. Peter. The Ancient One spoke in a warning tone. Peter's smirk continued to grow. Yes, teacher? Do you have a problem with me teaching one of the students? He asks, loud enough for everyone to hear. Sighing in annoyance, the Ancient One decided to hold her tongue for the time being. No, just remember not to teach him anything beyond his level. Of course. In a serene courtyard of Kamartage, Lily, MJ, and Doctor Strange stood in a line in front of Peter. The open space held an air of anticipation, as if the very air hummed with untapped potential. As they stood there, the warm breeze rustling through the foliage, Peter turned to MJ and Lily. All right, you two, go practice your eldritch constructs. I want to see those golden energies transformed into precise shapes, like we practiced yesterday. MJ nodded with a determined smile, leading Lily to a different corner of the courtyard where they began their practice. The golden energy danced between their fingertips, swiftly morphing and shifting into various forms under their guidance. Doctor Strange watched the two with a mixture of awe and curiosity. It was unlike anything he'd ever witnessed, the sheer control over the mystical energy was astounding. He looked back at Peter, a newfound respect in his eyes. Peter's training methods seemed to be different from the other masters. Peter caught Strange's attention and motioned for him to join him. All right, Stephen, now it's your turn. Strange stepped closer, his gaze fixed on Peter. What do you have in mind? Peter's eyes held a glint of mischief as he began to explain. First things first, you need to learn how to manipulate eldritch energy. After all, it's the basis of most of our mystic arts. Strange nodded, his determination evident. Show me. Peter extended his hand, summoning the same golden energy that MJ and Lily had been working with. He molded it into larger intricate patterns and shapes, the energy responding to his every thought. Now you try, Peter instructed. Strange hesitated, then extended his hand, summoning the golden energy. However, his attempts were met with limited success, the energy wavering and faltering under his control. Peter's expression was patient as he observed Strange's struggle. You're overthinking it. You have to feel it, let it flow through you. Strange closed his eyes, taking a deep breath and relaxing his stance. Slowly, the energy began to respond, forming delicate patterns in the air. As Strange's control improved, Peter's smile widened. Good. Now, let's take it up a notch. With a flourish of his hand, Peter conjured an even more intricate configuration of golden energy, shaping it into complex geometric forms. Strange's eyes widened at the sight, the challenge evident. Now, do the same, Peter said. Strange's brow furrowed in concentration as he attempted to replicate the pattern. The golden energy hesitated, but with a surge of determination, Strange managed to form a semblance of the shape. He looked at Peter with a mixture of frustration and determination. Why is this so much harder than their training? He asked, gesturing toward a Lily and MJ. Peter shrugged nonchalantly. If you want to return to your slow-paced classes, be my guest. A flash of determination ignited in Strange's eyes, his resolve unwavering. No, I'll do it. Peter's gaze softened as he recognized the spark of potential within Strange. Good. You're capable of far more than you know. This isn't just about conjuring energy. It's about bending reality to your will. Strange nodded, his focus returning to the golden energy between his fingertip. With renewed determination, he began to shape it, the complex pattern gradually taking form. As the hours passed, Strange's control improved, the golden energy responding more readily to his commands. The intricate forms he created began to rival even Peter's displays. Peter watched with satisfaction, knowing that he was unlocking a potential in Strange that had yet to be fully realized. 
He knew that Strange had the potential of a Sorcerer Supreme, so he refused to coddle him. And as the day stretched on, with the sun casting long shadows across the courtyard, Peter called their first day of training to an end. That's it for today. It's getting late and Lily has school tomorrow. As the family was preparing to leave, Strange stepped up and bowed once again. Can I join you tomorrow as well? Peter smirked, knowing that the Ancient One won't like this. Sure, we'll see you tomorrow. In the depths of a long-abandoned cathedral, Kaisilius and his devoted zealots gathered, their dark cloaks casting eerie shadows in the dim candlelight. Before them lay an intricate arrangement of mystical symbols, pulsating with an otherworldly energy. Kaisilius, his eyes ablaze with fanaticism, stood at the center, his followers forming a circle around him. With a low, resonating chant, the zealots' voices intertwined, resonating with the vibrations of the symbols. The air itself seemed to quiver as the ritual began, their connection with the dark dimension growing stronger with every word. As the chant reached its climax, the very fabric of reality seemed to tear, revealing a swirling vortex of darkness. From its depths emerged a presence that sent shivers down their spines, the dreaded Dormammu himself. Kaisilius and his zealots fell to their knees, their heads bowed in reverence as Dormammu's voice echoed around them. Kaisilius, my loyal servant, you have called, and I have answered. Speak your desires. Kaisilius, his voice trembling with reverence, stood and met Dormammu's gaze. We seek your guidance and power to carry out your will. Dormammu's presence seemed to swell, his approval tangible. Speak, we beseech you to grant us more strength, so that we're able and ready to act out your commands, Kaisilius declared, his voice unwavering. We wish nothing but to serve you, as best as we can. A sinister smile curled across Dormammu's formless visage. Very well. I shall grant you the means to achieve your desires, but I'm afraid you'll have to wait. Once you've struck down the sanctums, their barriers will crumble, and my influence shall seep into the realms. Then, and only then, will I be able to gift you more of my power. With a wave of Dormammu's incorporeal hand, a surge of dark energy enveloped Kaisilius and his zealots. Their bodies trembled as they felt his power, but couldn't absorb a single grain of it. Their senses overcome with a sensation both intoxicating and nightmarish. As the dark energy washed over them, Dormammu's voice reverberated through their minds. Go forth, my servants, and unleash the chaos you so desire. Strike down the sanctums and let the realms tremble. The ritual's energy peaked, and Dormammu's presence slowly began to fade. Kaisilius and his zealots watched as the vortex of darkness closed, leaving them with an even greater lust for power than before. Prepare yourselves, Kaisilius ordered, his voice carrying the weight of their dark pact. We commence our attack on the London Sanctum in two hours. The time has come to bring about the end of the Ancient One's feeble defense. His followers nodded, their eyes burning with power-hungry desire. The zealots scattered, each one preparing for the battle that would bring them closer to their ultimate goal, the annihilation of the Kamartak and the ascent of Dormammu's reign. Almost a month had passed since Doctor Strange joined Peter's training sessions. The London Sanctum's training room was abuzz with energy as the trio stood side by side, Lily and MJ flanking Doctor Strange. The room was bathed in soft, ethereal light, illuminating their focused expressions. Peter, standing at a distance, watched intently as the three of them practiced their mystic arts. He had chosen the London Sanctum for these sessions, knowing that the attack from Kaisilius and his followers was imminent. In the Doctor Strange movie, the London Sanctum was the first to fall. So Peter decided to spend his time here, waiting for Kaisilius to show up. The training sessions had been grueling, pushing Doctor Strange to his limits and beyond. Peter had been relentless, determined to bring out the Sorcerer Supreme within Strange. And his efforts had paid off. Doctor Strange had proven himself to be a prodigious student, mastering the control of eldritch energy and learning a wide array of spells. As Peter observed, he couldn't help but be impressed by Strange's progress. The air around him seemed to hum with energy as he conjured complex patterns of light and energy, weaving spells with a precision that was awe-inspiring. MJ and Lily, though not as advanced as Doctor Strange, held their own. Their dedication was evident in the way they worked together, their spells complementing each other seamlessly. Lily's AI mind seemed to grasp the intricacies of the mystic arts with remarkable ease, her natural affinity for magic shining through. With a wave of his hand, Doctor Strange conjured a shimmering shield of energy, blocking an incoming barrage of energy projectiles. He then countered with a burst of energy from his own fingertips, sending a surge of mystical force hurtling toward Lily. Lily reacted swiftly, weaving her own spell to redirect the energy, sending it harmlessly into the ground. MJ, on the other hand, focused her attention on Doctor Strange, 
her eyes glowing with determination as she conjured illusions to test his abilities. Peter's lips quirked into a half-smile as he witnessed their training. Dr. Strange's growth had been remarkable, far surpassing his own expectations. He had learned around 40 spells, mastered telekinesis, and just started delving into telepathy. He even mastered the use of the sling ring, a skill that had been surprisingly easy for him to acquire after his intense eldritch energy training. As the training session came to a close, Dr. Strange lowered his shield, his breathing steady despite the intensity of their practice. He turned to Peter, a mixture of exhaustion and satisfaction in his eyes. I never imagined I would come this far in such a short time. Peter nodded approvingly. You've put in the effort and it shows. But remember, don't get too full of yourself. You're still incredibly weak compared to most masters. Dr. Strange's gaze turned solemn. I understand. Peter's eyes met Strange's, a shared determination passing between them. Good. Because if you start getting an ego, I'll be forced to beat it out of you. MJ and Lily joined them, their faces flushed from the intense training. Lily smiled up at her father. How was I? Did I do good? Peter smiled warmly toward his daughter. You did amazing, my love. Lily perked up, her excitement palpable. He, I can't wait to show off my new spells. Peter ruffled Lily's hair affectionately. You'll get your chance. As the group began to make their way out of the training room, a loud explosion shook the sanctum, echoing through the hallways. Peter's senses tingled with anticipation as he turned to face the entrance of the building, his expression growing serious. They're here, he murmured, his voice carrying a weight of certainty. The air crackled with tension as Peter opened a swirling portal, leading to the entrance of the sanctum. Stepping through, he found the once intact door obliterated, the protective spells that had guarded it now nothing but ashes. His eyes narrowed as he surveyed the destruction, knowing that Kaisilius and his zealots had breached their defenses. Entering the sanctum's interior, Peter's gaze fell upon the figure of Kaisilius, casually strolling inside with an air of arrogance. Behind him, the zealots followed in eerie silence, their eyes gleaming with the twisted devotion that had ensnared them. Kaisilius' gaze locked onto Peter, a sinister smile curling his lips. Well, well, if it isn't the Ancient One's favorite student. Peter waved, his demeanor nonchalant. Yo. Kaisilius' smile twisted with envy, his jealousy clear in his tone. You're nothing more than a pet to her, aren't you? A mangy dog she picked up along the dash, Peter waved his hand, interrupting him. Save the monologue for someone else. I could care less about your insecurities. Kaisilius' lips curved into an annoyed frown. Oh, don't worry. I'll be sure say it all for the Ancient One when I deliver your lifeless corpse to her, a gift that will shatter her precious illusions. Peter wave him over. Enough talk. Let's get this over with. I got shit to do today. With a sudden motion, Kaisilius raised his hands, his fingers dancing with arcane symbols. Dark energy surged around him as he launched a barrage of projectiles toward Peter. The air crackled as Peter deflected them with a shimmering barrier of eldritch energy, the impacts causing ripples of energy to cascade through the room. Kaisilius' attacks came relentless, the zealots watching with unblinking eyes as their leader attempted to overpower Peter. But Peter's mastery of the mystic arts was undeniable. He wove intricate spells, conjuring defensive wards and launching counterattacks with fluid precision. The battle danced between them, the room bathed in the swirling lights of their magic. Peter's movements were swift and calculated, his control of eldritch energy evident as he twisted and redirected Kaisilius' assaults. As the confrontation escalated, the air seemed to crackle with energy, MJ, Lily, and Doctor Strange stepped through the open portal, their eyes widening as they took in the spectacle before them. Doctor Strange watched in awe as Peter's movements flowed seamlessly, each spell executed with a mastery that left him speechless. He had never witnessed such finesse in the mystic arts, and his respect for Peter's abilities grew exponentially. Even MJ and Lily were shocked by how skilled Peter truly was. They had seen him in action before, but he rarely used much more than a portal when fighting. Luckily, this time around, Peter couldn't use his spider powers, for fear of revealing his identity as Spider-Man, so it was all about magic today. Soon enough, the tide of battle shifted, Peter's attacks gaining momentum as he forced Kaisilius to retreat. With a sudden surge of power, he summoned a sword of pure eldritch energy into his hand. The weapon gleamed with an otherworldly light as Peter advanced, his expression focused and determined. Kaisilius stumbled back as Peter snapped his finger, sending a huge gust of wind his way. Before he knew what happened Peter appeared in front of him, his sword pressed close to his throat. The zealots watched in horror, their leader's dominance shattered. Peter's voice was steady, devoid of emotion. Any last words? Kaisilius' lips moved, 
But before he could utter a single syllable, Peter sensed the Ancient One's presence drawing near. Acting quickly, before she could interfere, Peter's grip tightened as the blade of eldritch energy slicing through flesh and bone with ease. Kaisalius' severed head fell to the ground, his vacant eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. Peter's expression remained impassive as he gazed down at the lifeless body. You know what? I didn't really care what you had to say. As he spoke, the Ancient One appeared beside him, frowning down at what was supposed to be her killer's headless body, a conflicted look in her face. The aftermath of Kaisalius' downfall left a somber tension in the air. The Ancient One stood beside Peter, her gaze fixed on the lifeless form of Kaisalius himself. A mixture of emotions churned within her. Satisfaction that her would-be killer was defeated, annoyance at Peter for intervening, and a gnawing uncertainty about what her future held now that her intended death had been thwarted. Peter watched her in silence, his expression a mix of sympathy and understanding. He had known that his actions would not be met with approval, yet he couldn't bring himself to stand by and watch her die. As much as he respected her choices, he couldn't ignore the bond they shared, a bond that compelled him to protect her. Meanwhile, the remaining followers of Kaisalius stood frozen in uncertainty, their eyes darting between the Ancient One and the Exit. The air was thick with tension as they considered their options, realizing that they were ill-prepared to face the wrath of a sorceress of her caliber. But before they could make their escape, the Ancient One's gaze turned toward them, her eyes ablaze with a fiery intensity. With a swift, almost casual gesture of her hand, she manipulated space itself, bending it with the force of her will. In an instant, the air around the zealots twisted and contorted, and a sickening crack filled the room. The trio of Doctor Strange, MJ, and Lily could only watch in shock as the scene unfolded before them. The Ancient One's mastery over mystic arts was beyond anything they had imagined, her power a force to be reckoned with. The air seemed to scream as the twisted space bent reality itself, and in the next moment, the remaining zealots collapsed to the ground, their severed heads tumbling beside them. Silence descended upon the room, broken only by the sound of lifeless bodies hitting the ground. The Ancient One's gaze remained fixed on the fallen zealots, her expression unreadable. She had taken her anger out on them, a silent display of the rage that simmered beneath her calm exterior. Doctor Strange's jaw hung open, his mind struggling to process the sheer magnitude of what he had just witnessed. His training had brought him into contact with extraordinary power, but this was on an entirely different level. After all, each of those zealots was a sorcerer with much more experience than himself. Killing them so easily was a huge blow to his ego. MJ and Lily stood beside him their eyes wide with a mixture of awe and a little bit of fear. Thankfully, MJ has seen death before and Lily was an AI, so the gruesome decapitations that just unfolded before them wasn't that big of a deal. The Ancient One slowly turned to face the trio, her gaze piercing through them with an intensity that sent shivers down their spines. Her lips parted as if to speak, but the words remained unspoken. The tension in the room was palpable, a heavy weight that bore down on them. Peter, sensing the unease that hung in the air, approached the Ancient One, his expression a mix of empathy and determination. He could feel the storm of emotions within her, and he understood the conflict that raged within her heart. With each step he took, he closed the distance between them until he stood before her. Taking a deep breath, he met her gaze with a calm resolve. I know you're angry at me, but I couldn't just stand by and watch you die. You're like a second mother to me, and I couldn't let that happen. The Ancient One's eyes softened, a hint of vulnerability flashing across her features. She averted her gaze for a moment, seemingly lost in her thoughts. Then, with a sigh, she finally spoke, her voice laced with a mixture of resignation and acceptance. You really won't let me go, will you, Peter? You know, they don't call me the Ancient One for nothing. I've already lived a very long life. Thousands upon thousands of years, in fact. Peter's lips curved into a small smile. Well, then what's another century or two to a bald hag like you? He said as he dodged a slap. Besides, there's so much more to do. MJ and I will get married sooner or later, and Lily is only just starting her life. You can't miss it, she nodded, a ghost of a smile touching her lips. Fine, I truly give up. You win. I'll live for as long as you're alive. Damn right, I win. And I plan to live for a long time so buckle up for an extended, happy life. Peter smirked, happy that she finally gave in. The three onlookers exchanged confused glances. None of them knew about the Ancient One's original intention to die at Kaisalius' hands. Peter had kept that detail well hidden, and their perplexed expressions mirrored their lack of understanding. The Ancient One let out a sigh, though the smile of her face couldn't be stopped. I look forward to it. Me too. Peter nodded as he reached out and gently placed a hand on her shoulder, 
his expression turning serious. And you don't have to go through everything alone, you know. I'm here for you. If you're lonely, come and stay at my house. I have spare rooms. And if you have troubles, tell me and I'll handle it. After all, life is easier when you can rely on others. Her gaze met his, gratitude and a hint of a tear glistening in her eyes. Thank you, Peter. With a reassuring nod, Peter stepped back, allowing her a moment of respite. The Ancient One turned her attention to the fallen zealots once more, her expression a mixture of sorrow and regret. The room was heavy with the weight of the lives lost, a reminder of the darkness that still lurked in the shadows. And as Doctor Strange, MJ, and Lily watched the scene unfold, they couldn't help but feel a newfound respect for the Ancient One, a respect that transcended the bounds of their previous perceptions. They were witnesses to a moment of vulnerability, a moment that revealed the complexities of a sorceress who had walked a path of both light and darkness for a very long time. Is she like the most powerful sorceress ever? Lily whispered to her mother, her voice filled with awe. MJ nodded slowly, her eyes wide as she regarded the Ancient One. Yeah, pretty much. Doctor Strange remained silent, his eyes locked on the Ancient One as he grappled with a mixture of admiration and trepidation. He had known her power was immense but witnessing it firsthand was an entirely different experience. Seeing the happy tears rolling down his teacher's cheeks, Peter wrapped his arms around her in a hug, surprising her with the sudden intimacy. I'm really glad that you won't die to some scrub sorcerer. I mean, it took me less than two minutes to kill that guy. It was a real letdown. The Ancient One's surprise melted into a begrudging acceptance, and she hesitantly returned the embrace. Really? Kaisilius is probably one of the strongest sorcerers from Kamartage. At least in the top ten, Peter grinned against her shoulder, his tone light. Then maybe we should revamp their training, because he was obscenely weak, and he even had a small power boost from Dormammu as well. Drawing back slightly, the Ancient Ones rolled her eyes as she regarded Peter. Well, not everyone can be as powerful as us. Shrugging, Peter gestured to Strange, MJ and Lily, who watched the scene with wide eyes. I think they have the potential. The Ancient One nodded in agreement. True. They've made great strides under your tutelage, Peter smirked playfully, his ego growing by the second. I know I'm great, aren't I? As the Ancient One blinked away her remaining tears, she couldn't help but slap him across the head. Stop being such a prat. It's unbecoming from a student of the Ancient One's stature. Peter smirked as he let her hit him. Now who's the one with the ego? The Ancient One let out a small chuckle, ignoring his words completely. But I have one question. How do you plan to sever my connection to Dormammu? Peter shrugged nonchalantly, his plan was already formulated. I've got a plan. I just need to borrow something from you. As his gaze fell to the eye of Agamotto that hung around her neck, the Ancient One raised an eyebrow in curiosity. The eye. Peter nodded, his eyes glinting with a mix of mischief and determination. Yeah, with this and another trinket in my possession, I think I'll have a better shot at handling Dormammu. The Ancient One considered his words for a moment, a wry smile touching her lips. Very well, Peter but you must promise to return it when you're done. Peter sighed in exasperation. Ah, come on, you're no fun. She simply raised an eyebrow, her unspoken retort evident in her gaze. With a defeated sigh, Peter relented. Fine, fine, I'll bring it back. He huffed in mock annoyance. Geez, I just saved your life and you're so stingy. As the Ancient One removed the eye of Agamotto from her neck and placed it around Peter's, there was a moment of connection between them, a silent understanding that transcended words. It was a gesture of trust, a recognition of the bond they shared. With one last nod, the Ancient One turned to leave, but Peter's voice stopped her. Hey, thanks for not dying on me. I'd be really sad if you left. He spoke honestly. Her gaze softened, and a tear slid down her cheek. Go, Peter. Do what you must. As the Ancient One departed, the room seemed to exhale, the tension gradually dissipating. Doctor Strange, MJ, and Lily exchanged bewildered glances, still puzzled by the entire exchange. How was she going to die? Strange mused aloud, still utterly confused. Lily shrugged. I don't know. As they spoke, Dr. Strange's gaze lingered on the eye of Agamotto, a confused look filled his face as he felt a connection with the odd necklace. Though the longer it remained in Peter's possession, the less he could feel this connection, as if Peter was slowly taking something away from him. Leaving the masters of the London Sanctum to deal with the aftermath, Peter, MJ, and Lily stepped through a portal back to their house. It's been a rather eventful day, after all. As they departed, Doctor Strange bid them goodbye and returned to Kamartage, ready to spend the rest of the day sifting through the library's endless knowledge. Back home, Peter was forced to recount the backstory for what just happened, explaining to MJ and Lily, who wouldn't stop pestering in for answers. 
His words flowed as he detailed the Ancient One's planned suicide and his own intervention to save her. MJ and Lily listened with rapt attention, happy that Peter was able to fix everything. After spending the day with his family, watching TV and just being lazy while he could, Peter tucked Lily into bed, reading her a bedtime story that was more scientifically accurate than most fairy tales. Due to her AI brain, she tended to like more realistic stories, so he had to edit a bunch of famous stories, adding explanations for all of the unexplained magic. And she loved it, for some odd reason. Good night, my love. With a kiss on her forehead, he left her room, moving toward his bedroom across the hall. In the sanctuary of his and MJ's room, Peter sat cross-legged on the floor. Before him lay the eye of Agamotto, its mystical aura pulsating gently. He had spent months preparing for this moment, poring over books, scrolls, and ancient texts in search of a way to sever the Ancient One's connection to Dormammu. It was a task easier said than done, for the entity's power was vast, and the bond forged between them was deep. Over the last couple of months, Peter had discovered that the Ancient One had tied herself so tightly to Dormammu that severing the connection was a monumental challenge. Not to mention the fact that Dormammu wasn't inclined to let go, and Peter would need to confront the godlike being within the dark dimension to force him to release his grip, which was easier said than done. As he contemplated his strategy, MJ entered the room, clad in pajamas, her concern etched on her face when she saw Peter engrossed in his preparations. Peter, she said softly, her voice tinged with worry. Are you really going through with this? Peter looked up from the eye of Agamotto, his expression a mixture of determination and reassurance. MJ, I have to. Dormammu won't give up, and even though we've dealt with Kaisalius, there might be others like him in the future. It's better to face Dormammu now, before things escalate. MJ sighed, walking over to him and sitting down. She regarded him with a mixture of love and concern. But facing Dormammu, he's different from anything you've ever faced before. You said he's a dimensional entity, a god in his own dimension. Are you sure that you can do this? Peter offered a small smile, reaching out to hold her hand. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Dormammu is a challenge, but I can't back down. The Ancient One's life is at stake, and it's up to me to protect her. MJ squeezed his hand gently, her eyes reflecting her worry. What are the odds that you win? Peter thought for a moment, then spoke with a mixture of confidence and caution. Before I had the Eye of Agamotto, I'd say around 20%. But now, with this artifact and my own abilities, I'd put it at around 90%. Maybe even higher, but I don't want to be overconfident, MJ sighed, leaning in to rest her head on his shoulder. Peter, promise me something. Promise that you'll come back. Peter wrapped his arm around her, holding her close. I promise. I'll do everything in my power to come back to you, Lily, and everyone else. A playful glint entered MJ's eyes, and she lightly slapped Peter's chest. Good, because if you don't, I'll find a way to resurrect you just so I can kill you myself. After all, I'm a sorceress now. Peter chuckled, a warmth spreading through his chest. Deal. And when I'm a spider zombie man, we can see if my family jewels are still working, MJ smirked, leaning up to press a quick kiss to his lips. Not happening. She pulled back and stuck her tongue out at him. I refuse to let any zombie bits near me, so you better not die. Before the mood could grow somber, Peter lightened it with a grin. Don't worry, I don't plan on it. I plan to be here, annoying you until the end of time. MJ rolled her eyes, a hint of a smile playing on her lips. Great, just what I always wanted. As the night stretched on, Peter continued to familiarize himself with the eye of Agamotto and mentally prepare himself for the confrontation ahead. The eye pulsed with energy, as if sensing the weight of the task at hand. In the midst of his focus, MJ's presence provided him with a sense of comfort and strength. Soon enough, in the quiet sanctity of his and MJ's room, Peter finished his meticulous preparations. The eye of Agamotto hung around his neck, its mystical power resonating with the spell he was about to cast. A spell that would hopefully be his trump card against his dimensional godlike enemy. Using golden eldritch energy, Peter drew intricate spell circles in the air, each one filled with a complex arrangement of runes and ancient writing. MJ watched in rapt attention and curiosity, awed by the advanced spell playing out before her. It was a spell he had devised himself, a potent mixture of his magic knowledge that he wouldn't have been able to accomplish without the eye of Agamotto's power over time itself. With a final flourish, Peter's hand stilled, his energy infused into the spell circles that now hung suspended before him. The golden light of the eldritch energy pulsed with an otherworldly glow, casting dancing shadows across the room. This spell was the linchpin of his plan, and without it, his odds of winning fall right back down to 20%. Thankfully, the spell was a success, or else I'd be screwed. 
Peter thought in relief. Turning away from his work, Peter faced MJ, who stood nearby with a mixture of concern and determination. Their eyes met, and he gave her a reassuring smile. I'll be back before you know it, MJ. I promise. MJ's gaze was filled with emotion, her worry etched on her face. She stepped closer to him, her voice soft and filled with a mixture of love and urgency. Peter, be careful. And come back to me. Lily and I need you. Peter nodded, his expression serious as he drew her into a warm embrace. You know I will. Their lips met in a final, tender kiss, a bittersweet reminder of the bond they shared. Then, reluctantly, they pulled apart, their fingers lingering before letting go. With one last lingering look, Peter turned and opened a portal with a flick of his wrist. The portal shimmered before him, leading to the ominous expanse of the dark dimension. As he stepped through the portal, Peter glanced back at MJ, who stood with tears in her eyes. With a determined nod, he disappeared from her sight, the portal snapping shut behind him. Inside the dark dimension, the vast expanse stretched out before him, a void illuminated by eerie colored gases that danced in the distance. The air was thick with an ominous energy, a palpable sense of foreboding that sent shivers down Peter's spine. The very nature of the dimension seemed to twist and churn with an unnatural quality, as if reality itself was fluid and malleable. In this surreal environment, the portal behind Peter closed with a soft whoosh, leaving him alone within the bleak expanse. He stood still for a moment, adjusting to the overwhelming atmosphere around him. It was then that he sensed movement in the distance. From the shadows emerged the mindless ones, pitch-black humanoid wraiths that swarmed toward him like a ravenous horde of starving, wild dogs. Their forms were twisted and grotesque, their eyes vacant and empty as they scrambled forward with an insatiable hunger and rage. But just as they drew close, a deep, rumbling voice echoed through the dimension, its words reverberating in Peter's ears. What do we have here? The voice was all-encompassing, filling the very fabric of the dark dimension itself. It carried an air of authority, a commanding presence that sent even the mindless ones scrambling in the opposite direction, their pursuit halted by its mere utterance. Peter stood his ground, his senses heightened as he gazed into the darkness ahead. Here we go. Suddenly, the very fabric of reality seemed to ripple and distort. A presence, immense and otherworldly, made itself known. Dormammu, the ancient and formidable ruler of this dimension, materialized before him, his figure casting a shadow that stretched across the void. Dormammu's form was colossal, towering above Peter like a giant among bugs. His sheer size was overwhelming, his body easily capable of containing entire worlds within its grasp. Yet, his form held an almost ethereal quality, as if his very being existed on the threshold between the material and the immaterial. Translucent and ghostly, Dormammu's body seemed to be a shifting tapestry of dimensions, as though one could peer through his form and glimpse the myriad layers of existence that he embodied. His figure was shrouded in an eerie, purple gaseous light, an ominous aura that radiated from every inch of his being. This spectral luminescence danced and swirled around him, casting eerie shadows that danced across the expanse of the dark dimension. Within the heart of the gaseous shroud, Dormammu's eyes and mouth glowed with the same ethereal purple hue, their radiance and unsettling contrast to the abyssal darkness around him. However, the ominous glow was not confined to a single color. Along his surroundings, other gaseous hues pulsed and shifted, creating a surreal and nightmarish rainbow that seemed to defy all logic. Dormammu's head was distinct from the rest of his form, an anchor in the chaos of his being. It resembled an aged skull, but one that had been carved with countless linear lines that ran from top to bottom, giving it an intricate and mesmerizing appearance. Insert picture of Dormammu here. As Dormammu's presence loomed before Peter, a feeling of insignificance washed over him. He stood like a solitary figure against the backdrop of an ancient cosmic force, his determination his only shield against the overwhelming might that confronted him. Yo, Peter waved casually. Peter's gaze remained locked onto Dormammu, his heart pounding in his chest. He couldn't deny the overwhelming power and presence that emanated from the colossal being before him. Yet, he refused to let fear paralyze him. With a deep breath, he steeled himself for the encounter ahead. Dormammu, Peter spoke with a confident grin, his eyes locked onto those of the dimensional godlike being. I've come to kick your ass. For a brief moment, Dormammu's ethereal form froze, his gaze locking onto Peter with a mixture of surprise and curiosity. No one had ever dared to speak to him in such a manner, let alone taunt him with a bold challenge. His deep, rumbling laughter echoed through the dark expanse, reverberating like the roll of distant thunder. Ah, uh, this is a first, Dormammu boomed, his voice resonating through the dimension. 
a mere insect defying me with such arrogance. You amuse me, little fool. Peter couldn't help but chuckle, a grin tugging at the corners of his lips. Spiders are arachnids, not bugs. There's a difference. He hasn't had the chance to say that for a while, and it felt good. Dormammu's laughter subsided, his eerie gaze narrowing as he regarded Peter with renewed interest. Why are you here, little bug? You might as well tell me before your death. Maybe I'll make it quick, if you're compliant. That is, if I feel like it. Why am I here? Peter straightened his stance, his expression unwavering. I've killed your followers. Kaecilius and his zealots are all dead. Well, actually the Ancient One killed the zealots, but the details don't really matter, do they? And I've come to ask you to release your hold on the Ancient One's soul and to never again threaten Earth's dimension. I want you to swear upon it. Dormammu's gaze remained fixed on Peter, his aura flickering with the mixture of emotions that surged within him. The concept of swearing an oath was not to be taken lightly in the mystical realms. Peter knew this, and he could sense Dormammu's hesitation. In the realm of dimensional beings and magic practitioners, making a vow was a sacred and dangerous act. By swearing upon something of immense importance, one was bound by the vow's terms, or else they'll face dire consequences. Although Peter was relatively new to the world of magic, compared to age-old masters, who have been studying for hundreds of years, he had witnessed the power of vows firsthand. Years ago, during his early days as a student of Kamartage, a fellow student had rashly made a vow to never betray his girlfriend. And a few days later, said girlfriend found him talking to a woman in a courtyard, alone. Just for a fraction of a second, she felt the tiniest bit of betrayal, which set off the vow. In a gruesome instant, the poor student's life was taken, leaving behind only a bloody mist as a testament to the power of his ill-fated vow. And worst of all, the person he was along to turned out to be a middle-aged man. She only thought it was woman because of the long hair. That day, Peter learned that even the tiniest of misunderstandings could set off a vow, especially if they're vague enough. Understanding the stakes, Dormammu regarded Peter with both intrigue and caution. Why should I humor your request? He asked as if Peter were an idiot. I knew you wouldn't agree. Peter smiled, a bloodthirst grin spread across his face. I challenge you to a battle, Dormammu. If I win, you'll have to abide by my terms. But if you win, I'll serve you for eternity. Dormammu's eyes gleamed with interest, his spectral form shifting in the darkness. A battle? Interesting. Peter held his ground, his gaze unwavering. To win, one side must be either be dead, unconscious, or surrender. A low, resonant chuckle escaped Dormammu, his voice a chilling echo that reverberated through the expanse around them. Very well, I accept your challenge. After all, what does he have to be afraid of? This is the dark dimension, and he's a god here. Got him. Peter smirked. Should we swear on it now, dot? Eager, aren't we? Dormammu's booming voice sounded amused. Peter held Dormammu's gaze, his voice resolute. Well, I'd rather we set everything in stone beforehand. That way, you can't weasel your way out of it after I win. Dormammu regarded Peter with a mixture of skepticism and amusement. Very well. I accept your challenge and swear my existence on its terms. But know this, if you fail, your fate will be sealed, and you will serve me for eternity. Agreed. And I swear my existence on the terms as well. Peter replied firmly, feeling the vow form between them. Just remember, victory can be achieved through surrender, incapacitation, or death. Dormammu's form shifted, a nod of acknowledgement rippling through the gaseous shroud that surrounded him. Then let the battle commence. Prepare yourself. A moment of tension between Peter and Dormammu seemed to stretch infinitely, the weight of their challenge filling the air around them. Before the first blows were exchanged, a palpable energy charged the atmosphere, and Peter began to change. Peter's form seemed to transform, his muscles bulging and his skin turning a fiery shade of red. With a powerful surge of energy, he morphed into the imposing figure of the Red Hulk. Dormammu's eyes flickered with an impressed glint as he observed the transformation, his spectral form hovering above the ground. You've truly embraced the power of rage, how curious, Dormammu mused, his voice carrying a mix of intrigue and arrogance. But even in this form, you are nothing before me. Peter met Dormammu's gaze with a defiant smile, his towering frame radiating a sense of raw power. I've had some practice with this power. Fought a dragon once. Wasn't too impressed though, felt like it could have been stronger. Dormammu's lips curled into a smirk, his eyes narrowing with amusement. A dragon, you say? How quaint. Let's see if I can provide a more suitable challenge for you. With a casual wave of his hand, Dormammu's power surged, and the dark dimension around them seemed to tremble with the unleashed energy. The air crackled with an otherworldly intensity, 
and the battle between them intensified as they clashed once more. The ebb and flow of their fight unfolded in a relentless dance, a fierce back-and-forth exchange that resonated with cosmic power. Peter's blows connected with Dormammu's form, creating shockwaves that reverberated through the dimension. Yet, Dormammu's retaliation was swift and powerful, his attacks striking with a ferocity that tested Peter's endurance. As they exchanged blows, Peter seized every opportunity to taunt his formidable opponent. Is that all you've got, Dormammu? I was expecting something more impressive. Dormammu's response was a surge of energy that sent Peter hurtling through the air, crashing into a distant expanse of the dark dimension. The impact was powerful, but Peter quickly regained his footing, his body unyielding in the face of the assault. Not bad, Peter remarked, grinning as he wiped a trickle of blood from his mouth. But I've felt worse. Dormammu's eyes glowed with an icy intensity as he unleashed a torrent of dark energy, the malevolent force slicing through the air with an otherworldly shriek. Peter braced himself to withstand the attack. His form absorbed the impact, the energy crackling around him as he emerged and scathed. But the battle was taking its toll. Despite his best efforts, he was struggling to match Dormammu's overwhelming power. In a desperate move, he channeled the fiery energy within him, surrounding himself with the searing flames of the phoenix. Dormammu's form flickered with surprise as the intense heat engulfed Peter. The flames of the phoenix were legendary, the hottest and most destructive force in the universe. Yet, even as the flames raged, Dormammu's composure remained unshaken. After all, only the phoenix itself could scare him. Peter only wielded the tiniest fraction of its power. With a roar, Peter charged at Dormammu, his flaming fists striking with a force that reverberated through the dimension. Dormammu countered with a surge of dark energy, the clash of their powers sending shockwaves that rippled outward, distorting the very fabric of the dimension. Dormammu's eyes glinted with irritation as Peter's attacks continued to find their mark, his defenses faltering under the onslaught. His anger surged, fueling his next attack with a reckless intensity. Suddenly, with an eruption of dark energy, Dormammu opened his mouth, unleashing a thick beam of dark power that washed over Peter, erasing his existence in an instant. Oh shit, Peter thought as he died. Dormammu's form shifted as he sighed in exasperation, a hint of annoyance coloring his voice. I let my anger cloud my control. What a foolish mistake. He muttered, annoyed that he accidentally killed what could have been a fairly impressive servant. Yet, before Dormammu's thoughts could fully solidify, an odd phenomenon unfolded. The dimension seemed to ripple and rewind. Seconds later, Peter reappeared where he had stood moments before, his form alive and intact. The eye of Agamotto around his neck glowed with a pulsating green light, an eerie symbol of his control over time itself. Dormammu's spectral eyes widened in disbelief, a flicker of confusion crossing his face. What is this? Did I not eradicate you? Just as the confusion began to set in, a familiar portal materialized exactly where a Peter first arrived, and surprisingly, another Peter stepped through, his casual demeanor and familiar words echoing through the dark dimension. Yo, he said, waving casually. Dormammu, I've come to kick your ass. The original Peter's gaze turned toward his past self, a wry smile tugging at his lips. Oh, it already started. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.